All right, if you can all please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You remain standing, Heather Riley. Please, uh, if you can give us our invocation as our police chaplain. God of all creation, first, let me say thank you. On behalf of all who are gathered here today, thank you for your abundant blessings. Thank you for life itself and for the measure of health we need to fulfill our callings. Thank you for the ability to be involved in useful work and for the honor of bearing appropriate responsibilities. Thanks for our freedom. We thank you for our community and all who serve it, for those who teach and who protect, those who clean and who repair, those who work in parks and work on roads, those who plan and make the plans happen, those who heal and who counsel, those who govern and who elect, for all who live in, into the best example of what it means to be a citizen. In the scriptures, you have said that citizens ought to honor the governing authorities since you have established them to promote peace and order and justice. Therefore, I pray for our mayor, for our various levels of city officials, and in particular for this assembled council. I'm asking that you would graciously grant them wisdom to govern amid the conflicting interests and issues of our time. A sense of the welfare and true needs of our people, a keen thirst for justice and rightness, confidence in what is good and fitting, the ability to work together in harmony even when there is honest disagreement, personal peace in their lives, and joy in their tasks. May God reign in the agenda set before you today, that it would benefit those who live, work, and play in our beloved city of Santa Ana. Make us great in your mighty and majestic name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I'm going to call on uh, Mayor Pro Tem Martinez. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor uh, today, this evening. I'm actually doing a proclamation. Uh, Mark Laurent, uh, who worked uh, assistant, uh, assistant to the uh, city manager uh, and actually helped with council services in my 11 years, but uh, has had a long career here um, in the city of Santa Ana. So after 24 years of service, Mark Lawrence retired from the city of Santa Ana on July 5th. He first started um, in the city as a public works, in the public works agency, and it was great to hear the story at his retirement uh, party, how he was late and how he's late here again. <laughs> <laughs> Some things never change, Mark. Uh, and then was promoted to the city manager's office where he worked for 16 years. And I shared my story at his retirement party and how I first met Mark. Um, I, you know, I was a Parks and Rec Commissioner uh, for the city before I got elected to the Santa Ana City Council. And I always saw Mark, um, you know, either getting his shoe shine at, with candy um, or at the Italian restaurant. And everyone would always want to speak to him. He was always shaking hands. I was like, man, who is this dude? And certain enough, you know, lo and behold, you know, he's assistant, uh, um, you know, to the city manager and really providing council ser services um, to, to the city council. Essentially, when the residents would give us a call or send us an email, guess who would we uh, give that information to to help us deal with those issues? Mark Lawrence. So he's the guy that has made us look wonderful for all these years. And I could, you know, testify beyond just our assistants up there at City Hall who he was responsible for. But he did some amazing things. And what I can tell you is that he was able to work with the staff. 
And that is important because a lot of times the residents in the business community think that we just can call our public works director or call you know, our police chief or our, or our parks and rec director and hey, go do this. We actually have a process. We actually have to go through the city manager's office uh, and then um, go through Mark and then um, you know, get some of those um, issues that come before this city council address. And so he's the, uh, he essentially has been that person for us and, sp and specifically on a lot of our special projects um, for, for the city council. So it's been uh, uh, an honor, you know, Mark, working with you uh, directly to help, um, you know, shape the lives here of, of the residents and, and the business community here in this city. And I, I wanted to recognize you know, um, Mark uh, here today and really proclaim and, 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 and do something very special for him to commit this amount of time. And believe me, it's not easy working on the eighth floor, not always easy working with council members, right? We all have different personalities. We all have different issues. We all have different projects. But to be able to navigate not only through the eighth floor, but also navigate through the, the through the various departments. That's not easy. I know we we work with Julie now, and, and certainly Julie could attest. And Jorge, you know, it, 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 it's a daunting task at times. So it, for us, it's real easy to send an email. Hey, Julie, I need you to take care of this. Or hey, Miss City Manager, can you please, you know, do X, Y, and Z? And then we kind of kind of get out of the way, and then they then have to move forward with the work. So it's not um, as easy as as I'm saying it and so thank you Mark for your dedication not only to to the city managers um, office and, and the staff up there but to the city council and more importantly to the residents of this community who definitely have respected you over all these years and also the business community uh, before I um, provide this proclamation I'm not sure if there's any members of the city council that like to say something and then uh, would like to hear from you Mark well, I, I wanted to say something. I wanted to thank you, Mayor Pro Tem, for doing this for Mark. And, you know, we could probably uh, designate this month as Mark Lawrence Month, and we could probably erect a statue to him, and that still wouldn't be enough, right? Mark's been around the city for so long, and he's somebody who came up through the organization. And I had the um, blessing of knowing Mark before I came on the city council, and I knew his brother, who was on the bankruptcy circuit with me as young attorneys. But um, Mark is just probably one of the most quality people that uh, this organization's ever, um, you know, brought through. And um, Mark always had um, a kind word for everybody. He treated everybody the same, and that was probably one of his best assets, which was, you know, he would deal with people uh, who had very large businesses in town, very large developments, and he dealt with residents who were very humble and, and you know, and maybe monolingual Spanish speakers, but Mark was the same way with everybody. And so I, I don't remember anybody ever saying a bad thing about Mark. And, you know, by the looks of him, he's, you know, retirement's treating him pretty well. I thought maybe he was going to come back in a suit and say, well, look, will you guys take me back? But uh, he looks way too relaxed, man. So, you know, but I, I just wanted to thank him. And one, one thing, I'm not going to embarrass you much longer. And even though he went to SC, that's okay. You know, we'll, we'll, forgive, we'll, we'll forgive him for that. But... Um, but, uh, you know, Mark, when he would, you know, if you saw his desk, he had a huge desk, and he'd have papers all over the desk, and you could barely see the wood because he'd have stacks of, you know, different items that he was working on for constituents. But when Mark would get really frazzled, and I knew sometimes when I'd walk into uh, to his office and I'd peek my head in, he's very, very fair-skinned. But when he would get nervous, he'd get super red. So when I saw that red hue on his face, man, I beelined out of there because I realized he was under the gun. But Mark, you're going to be missed. Uh, thank you on behalf of all the residents for the great work you've done over the years and for being patient with all of us and for lending your talents to this city. Thank you, Mark. Jose? Uh, yes. Uh, so I've known uh, Mark now for, for a number of years, uh, you know, then and now. And... Uh, He's, you know, he's the real public servant. I mean, he's the real deal. Shows up on time, even after the many years. Wouldn't take advantage of, you know, long breaks or lunches or vacations. Was always there doing his work. A very, very loyal staffer. Uh, and as Council Member Sarmiento was saying, really loved by a lot of members in the community, whether they were uh, English speakers or, or Spanish speakers. I know one of my uh, 
very good friends, uh, Roberto Laurian, oh, yeah, Roberto has such a fondness that he would call him Marcos. Marcos. You know, his name is Mark, but you know, he was, you know, finally known uh, as Marcos uh, by him. And uh, whether the request bit was big or small, Mark was always there to help him and, and others. Uh, and then there were some very memorable, fun events. Uh, including the government relations there that he had a lot of responsibility for. So some years ago when we hosted uh, Mexican President Fox uh, in the downtown, uh, Mark was a big part of making that event successful and safe. Uh, also, uh, we had uh, George W. Bush at the Bowers Museum, uh, and Mark was a big uh, part of that. Uh, but at the end of the day, whether you're an elected or, or someone in the community, you know, what you want from your elected or your government staffers is follow up you know at least if somebody calls or emails you know make a real effort to get back to them and provide a response and uh, for that you know you get an A plus uh, in, in my book and I don't give many people an A plus so <laughs> thank you so much for your service and we wish you well Mark you're in a class all by yourself you are gold I've told you that many times all the knowledge, all your uh, experience, thank you for being patient with me as a new council member. I take it to heart. All your advice, all those talks we had, um, you know, I just appreciate your help very, very, very much. And, you know, we had that long talk before you, your last day, so you know, I don't want to take everyone's time. But, you know, you, I, w I, w I wish you were still with us, you know, but uh, please come on back. You're always welcome. You know that. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Juan. So before I end and I pro provide this proclamation, Mark, please uh, do give us a couple of your words. Okay. Um, well, extremely humbled. Uh, humbled to be uh, recognized by the Marin City Council. Um, I love this community. Um, I, people ask me, how's retirement? Retirement is great because I'm, <laughs> I'm doing a lot of things that uh, I've been putting off for years. But I really do miss this community and I miss my colleagues, my staff. Um, and, and the Marin City Council. So um, I got a heavy heart about this community, um, and I hope uh, to be back in some way, some fashion down the road um, in the community and seeing if I can continue to help. Um, I just really want to thank uh, the mayor and the city council from the bottom of my heart uh, for all their support over the years, and of course, Mayor Pro Tem Martinez, uh, Councilmember Solorio, uh, Councilmember Viegas, Benavides, um, uh, of course, Councilmember Sarmiento and Councilmember Tinajero, who have all been wonderful uh, to work for. And I just want to congratulate them for their vision and their leadership because it's a tough job what they have. And uh, so I, I just want to recognize all of you. And I want to recognize the city staff. Uh, for helping me be successful and uh, last but not least my colleagues the executive managers the executive management team city manager city attorney city clerk uh, and uh, Jorge Garcia and Julie Castro and and the other fine folks on the uh, city in the city manager's office so with that I just thank you great thanks Mark and I told uh, let's give him a round of applause One of the things since, you know, prior to uh, me uh, getting elected and what I did for a living, I was a human resource director for eight years for a company called Go Coast Baking Company, who he knew, who was my father figure, and was the owner of that uh, company, and was very involved in this city. His name was Mark uh, Press, like printing press. And, uh, you know, um, as I look back and, and I think of, uh, you know, at 21 being an HR director for a major company here in the city of Santa Ana and, and realizing that what's important is its people. I always tell folks that, yes, buildings are beautiful and they're great, but what makes cities beautiful, what makes cities thrive, it's its people. Not only our residents, but the, the, the employees um, in this city 
And, so, and I, I, I tell my colleagues I'm an equal opportunity when it, I, and, and, uh, it, when it comes to of, of how I treat people. And, and, I, and I've always done my best to, 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 to treat um, the employees with the utmost respect. I may not agree on every issue, especially when it comes to our finances, and I, but, but they all know where, where I'm coming from, that I've always been honest uh, when, when it comes to that. And uh, my relationship with Mark has always been an honest one, and, and um, I always respected how he treated this council, even though at times we were adversary um, um, on certain issues, but he always put the city first. And that's why I admire him so much. Because it takes a lot to, 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 to address a lot of the issues that we face here in the city. And, you know, we're going into his office and, hey, you know what, we need you to do this. We, we're pressured in time. And, you know, he's just like, whatever I can do to get it done, I'm going to get it done. And, and, and that meant a lot, Mark. Um, you know, so you really uh, did a, fast, a, a fantastic job, um, not just for this council, but for this entire city. And, and you're definitely going to be missed. So on behalf of our mayor and an entire city council, um, and I won't do all the whereas is, um, whereas in your retirement, Mark, we will continue, please continue to do what you do and enjoy uh, your life playing racquetball, going on trips and cruises. Geez, wow, watching USC football games, listening to music, and attending concerts. And now, therefore, we, the mayor and the city council of the city of Santa Ana, do hereby declare August 1st, 2017, as Mark Lawrence Day. I know, he has, he has a boots. You know he's on retirement when he has boots on. A lot of hugs. Come back, Mark. Every August 1st. Every August 1st, you got to come back and volunteer. <laughs> Every August 1st, we'll see you back here. Um, I see my friends from Cal Optima. If you can all come up, I know I see a variety of you. Uh, so, so please uh, come forward. Uh, we all know that many things are important in our lives, but obviously our health uh, comes first. We got to take care of ourselves and we got to take care of our children and loved ones. Uh, and we are blessed in uh, California to have uh, a very good health care system. You know, at the federal level, that discussion is struggling a little bit. But here in California, we're keeping it strong. And uh, in California, for folks that are uh, low income, we have something ca called Medi-Cal. Uh, but here in Orange County, we really have branded at that under the umbrella of CalOptima. And so CalOptima is, uh, you know, a health care plan and has a variety of services that's to great benefit of our community. And so I know when I recently saw Magnolia Moreno doing outreach in the community and I see him everywhere, I thought, well, there's something different with Cal Optima, especially here in Santa Ana and the Latino community. And she told me about it. So I thought, you know, I'm going to bring you all back and, uh, and recognize you. So let me uh, inform uh, the audience and our uh, watchers at home about this. So Cal Optima, like I said, is uh, California's Medi-Cal system. It's a community-based health plan serving low-income residents here in Orange County. Uh, we serve here in Orange County through Cal Optima 800,000 residents, uh, including 141,488 who reside in the city of Santa Ana. Um, which is approximately 43% of the city's population. So 43% of the city's population uh, is in the Cal Optima system. So it's significant, and so a lot of our 
families, you know, get their health care through Caloptima. So it's very important, and the relationship uh, is very important. Uh, countywide, the Latino population comprises approximately 30% of Caloptima's total membership. Uh, and as part of their overall mission, they aim to provide members with access to quality health care services, which include materials translated into seven different languages, and interpreter services for both customer service as well as um, accompaniment to in, in appointments. Uh, in 2016, which is really why we're here, because I noticed it, uh, Cal Optimus Community Relations uh, Department launched an innovative launched an initiative uh, to identify, establish, and strengthen relationships between Caloptima and organizations serving the Latino community, uh, including through the following efforts. Number one, enhance communication efforts in the Latino community through projects aimed at capturing human interest stories, creation of an infographic on how individuals can access health care benefits, Caloptima presentations in the Latino community. Uh, number two, uh, monthly cafecito, meetings attended by community-based organizations that provide programs and services in the community. Uh, and third, increased participation in community events serving the Latino community, thereby building capacity in the community. And again, they've been very much uh, noticed. Uh, we have two individuals here from Cal Optima uh, today. They're public affairs uh, manager in community relations, Tiffany Ka'ai Kamuno. Uh, as well as uh, uh, Magnolia Moreno, she goes by Maggie as well, yeah. and she also used to serve us in the state senate uh, as well. You know, you'll see, including the agenda today and a discussion later in the meeting, uh, there's a lot of dialogue about the, the leadership of Cal Optima, especially uh, at the board level and its interactions with the board of supervisors, and uh, we're going to be discussing that. Uh, you know, thanks to Councilmember Sarmiento wanting to discuss this uh, with us today. Uh, but what happens at the board level, you know, really is different. That's what, what's happening at the staff level. When the staff is doing a great job, again, already through their efforts, uh, they're they're benefiting 43 percent of our community and. Santa Ana, uh, so it's an amazing amount, uh, and so on behalf of the mayor and city council, uh, we thank them and give them a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. And a few words, please. On behalf of Cal Optima, I want to express my gratitude for this recognition. Um, at this time, I'd also like to recognize Maggie Moreno. She's our Spanish bilingual community relations specialist and I really admire her passion, her hard work and commitment to the Latino community. So again, thank you and we look forward to continued collaboration to serve our members in the city of Santa Ana. So thank you very much. Thank you. And before I, I give them this, I also hope that the number will increase because I know even with the many that do have uh, Cal Optum in our community, there are still many that don't have uh, health care. So uh, your plan will work for many of those in our community. And so I ask you both to keep your commitment to doing outreach in Santa Ana to keep our community healthy. Again, on behalf of the mayor and city council, congratulations. Thank you very much. I think uh, many folks here know, because most of you are very community-oriented, uh, Santa Ana has a, a long tradition uh, through this program called Celebrate Santa Ana, uh, where we bring out a lot of programs that we're doing in our community. We recognize a lot of leaders. Uh, and in June, uh, we held that event at the Heritage Museum of Orange County. Uh, and I was very impressed with uh, quality of the leaders that we had there with us being recognized. Uh, at that event, I was joined by uh, Mayor Pro Tem Martinez and Council Member Benavides. Uh, and I thought, uh, you know, for those that could come, uh, we'd love to recognize them here at our council meeting as well. Uh, this year, there were 12 community building awards that were presented, and we have certificates for all of them. I'm not sure if they all are here, but I would like to have them uh, come up. Uh, Carlos Aguilar, artist for 
Among Heroes Mural, so come on up. Peter Chang, uh, Child Creativity Lab. Uh, Corporal Gonzalo Garcia with the Santa Ana Police Department. Captain Stephen Horner, Orange County Fire Authority. Dr. Susie Lopez Guerra with the Santa Ana Unified School District. Uh, Mario Morales with the Southeast uh, Victory Outreach Peace and Unity uh, Group. Uh, Patty Perales Huerta Mesa uh, with Padres Unidos. And a fan club. Wow, very good. Uh, from Immaculate Heart of Mary, Father uh, Edward Podgen, uh, the San Ana Healthy Neighborhoods Alliance uh, leaders. Uh, and I do see a, a rep from them as well. Uh, from El Centro Cultural de Mexico, especially Radio Santana, Luis Sarmiento. Uh, from uh, our very uh, uh, loved uh, Taller San Jose and Hope Builders, Shauna Smith. I know I saw her here early. Uh, maybe she's still here or, or not. Okay, you're right behind me. Okay, so you're, you're, you always plan ahead. Uh, and then uh, Rose uh, Wolfram with the Illumination Foundation Children's Resource Center. Let's give them all a big round of applause. And I am going to pick a, a couple to speak, if, if you don't mind. We obviously have uh, many here, but I'd like to have uh, Patty Perales, Huerta Mesa, maybe say a couple words. Right? And then we'll have Shauna Smith also. On behalf of Padres Unidos, I'd like to thank um, the very honorable Mayor Pulido and the council members for this great honor. Um, uh, also, I'd like to say thank you to my mom, who happens to be the executive director for Padres Unidos, who's <coughs> also here, and she's uh, my hero, my inspiration, my role model. She's actually dedicated most of her life to um, walking alongside families in Santa Ana. So um, more importantly, I'd like to ask all the families that are here that are from Padres Unidos, the kids, the, the moms, the sisters, the parents, the teachers, all of you guys, please stand up, because this is for you guys. Thank you. And we hope to be able to continue walking alongside, you know, successful families, build successful communities, and we love, we love our community, and we love walking alongside each one of you. Thank you. So thank you so much, Council Member uh, Solorio, for this uh, honor. And it's really been my privilege and uh, the privilege of Taller San Jose Hope Builders for the last 22 years to work with the young adults in our community to help them plug into their uh, into workforce opportunities and to advance themselves, their young lives, and their family. And we're proud to do that in the, uh, the city of Santa Ana. Um, and so really on behalf of all the staff and the students at Taller San Jose Hope Builders, we thank you for this. And again, uh, Mayor Pretend Martinez was at that event as well, and with all the rec folks being recognized, if you could say a few words yes. as well. Council. Thank you, Jose, for really um, uh, bringing them here to, to, to really recognize them in front of not only the audience here, but all those who were not able to uh, celebrate and come to celebrate Santa Ana. For your recognition and really the great work that you all have done in our community, and I said it in, in, in my small speech that, again, what makes Santa Ana very special is the folks like yourselves and the organizations and the work that you all do. You make this city look great and you make this mayor and council look great for the amazing work that you do every single day in this community. So thank you all very much. Carlos Aguilar. Peter Chang. Child Creativity Lab. And Carlos was with Artists for Among Heroes Mural. Thank you. Uh, Gonzalo Garcia, Corporal with San Antonio. <laughs> Captain Stephen Horner with the Orange County Fire Authority. Uh, I don't see a Dr. Lopez Guerra, but we'll, we'll mail it to her. Uh, Mario Morales, 
Southeast Victory Outreach. Don't see him here. Uh, Patty Perales Huerta Mesa. Congratulations. <laughs> Uh, I don't think I see uh, uh, Father uh, Edward. Uh, we'll get it to him as well. Uh, Santa Ana Healthy Neighborhood Alliance. Both of you come up. All of you. Thank you. Thank you. They were also part of the Wilshire Square uh, event over the weekend, which, is, which was fantastic. Uh, and then uh, with uh, Taller San Jose Hope Builders and an incredible internship and job program that you have right now as we speak. Congratulations and thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, from the Illumination Foundation, uh, Ch Children's Resource Center, Rose Wolfram. Congratulations. Thank you so much for making Santa Ana a place to celebrate. Congratulations. <laughs> Now we're going to hear from Councilmember Villegas and Maria Fierro. Are you here? Or uh, Kedris Adili? Please come on down. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would also like to uh, call up front. Um, Ophelia Velarde Garcia from uh, Supervisor Andrew Doe's office, Avalino Valencia from State Assembly Tom Daly's office, uh, Tracy Theodore from the Orange County Family Justice Center in Anaheim. If you could please join us it would, up here, th we appreciate it. Thank you. So, thank you very much, everyone, for Chief. Uh, I, am, uh, I am pleased to make this presentation this evening on a matter that is great, of great uh, public importance to me and of great concern, the issue of domestic violence that has affects many people here in our communities. Too many people, too many children and many families experience violence in their home. And it is also one of the most dangerous calls that our police officers respond to. A lot of people get injured. A lot of people, uh, you know, there's a lot of death involved sometimes. It's unfortunate for me to, to report. And so there's a lot of cities that are already addressing this issue. And the city of Santa Ana, for being such a large city here in Orange County, we need to address this also. In 2016, we had 6,000 52 calls for service regarding domestic violence, which generated 2,936 reports. Here in 2017, and we're not, we're about halfway or a little bit over halfway, we're at 2,962 calls for service on domestic violence, and we've had 1,446 as of today. Those are the numbers for reports generated. Reason I bring this up, we need to do more. We need to bring a lot more services to Orange County. These two individuals right here, these, these great people that I have been working with throughout the years, want to recognize them for their hard work in bringing education and services to our communities. And let me just say a little bit about uh, each of them. Maria Fierro here, 24 years with the Orange County Social Services Agency, 11 years with La Mujer de Hoy Domestic Abuse Empowerment, Kara Thilly, uh, many years with the various nonprofits, both work for four girls, 
uh, nonprofit also with dealing with middle-aged teens and violence prevention, parenting programs and survivor programs. But one thing they have in common also is they both were working at the Orange County Family Justice Center, which is a very special place. And so today, for all your hard work and for everything you've been doing, I want to, uh, the city and I, want, we want to recognize you for your hard work. And we have these proclamations for you from the city of Santa Ana. We don't want to recognize everything that you've done for us, Miria Fierro and Kareth Dilley. If you want to say a few words. Um, well, I've been a, working with domestic violence victims for over 25 years. My goal was to save one life. And as you know, it's been many. I lost the count. But I also want to thank um, Councilman Juan Villegas, who has supported me on all the different programs. La Mujer de Hoy for 11 years, empowering women of domestic violence. So I want to thank you, Juan, for that. Um, he also has donated his book called um, Fam La Vida Tiene Valores, which is, you know, life has values that we have used um, for our different programs. Um, and I will continue the effort to end domestic violence. And I would like to invite all of those professionals, you know, responsible citizens, to join us in the effort of ending domestic violence. Thank you. Thank you so much. I do want to recognize City Council Member Juan Villegas uh, for this effort and for everybody in the city um, to really come forward and break the cycle of violence. It sounds so easy and yet it is so difficult. We, what we saw so much in family violence is that it is family. It's the violence that gets passed down from generation to generation. And so here what we want to do in Santa Ana is what we've done in Anaheim and in other parts of Orange County, and it's break that cycle. So thank you so much for your leadership, and thanks to the entire city council for their leadership and recognition as well. Thank you. So with that being said, there is something that I have been working at Maria and Kareth and I. We've been working uh, quietly on for some time. God, it's been about a year now trying to put everything together. And um, so I'll, I will say I've begun working with local, regional, and state, federal officials to identify ways to address the epidemic of violence in the home. And what we would like to bring to the future here in Santa Ana, and I'm announcing this evening, we want to bring a family justice center just like the one modeled in the great city of Anaheim. It is a, it is a location where people... Uh, where victims can go and feel safe with, uh, and have uh, confidential uh, work done. They can have their resources brought to them. In other words, it's a one-stop service center where they can have all this uh, brought to them because it's, those victims are in a very difficult situation and uh, it's very, very hard for them to go out and travel and just even try to get, come up with a plan to leave those kinds of relationships so they can have a, a safer home. Uh, if you would like to come forward, uh, Trace, and sit, give, tell us a, uh, a brief on the Family Justice Center in Anaheim. Absolutely. Thank you. Sure. So the Orange County Family Justice Center located in Anaheim is a collaboration of 17 government agencies and nonprofits that provide many of the resources that victims of family violence need. So prior to this type of collaboration, and like in this scene, in many cities, victims of family violence have to go to various different locations to get all of the various services that they might need. For example, they might need a temporary restraining order, so they would have to go to the courthouse, or they may need to go to a shelter to find a place to live, or they may need to go to CalWORKs to get their services. Um, at the Family Justice Center, all of the resources are under one roof, so they can come to the center, be met by a victim advocate who will do a needs and a danger assessment and bring the various resources to those survivors in one place so it's much easier for them to get the services that they need to get out of the dangerous situation so certainly every community uh, would benefit from a family justice center and no two better ladies to lead the effort than these two so thank you very much for your efforts
Thank you, Ms. Theodore. We appreciate it. You know, the uh, City of Anaheim has uh, offered to help us. And uh, the reason that I ask all these uh, departments and officers to uh, other agencies to come forward because they are here to support us to make this uh, happen. So we have support at the congressional level, at the state level, from the county, and the police department is going to be heading this. And uh, we look forward to bringing this to Santa in the future. Family Justice Center. Thank you very much. And thank you. Good job, Councilman Villegas, a very worthy cost, and thank you uh, for all the representatives that were here today and uh, this effort to, you know, support uh, and establish a domestic violence services uh, here in Orange County. So with that, um, all right, so with that, let's, um, first let me ask the city Attorney, if there's anything to report out of close uh, session, please. Mayor, we have three items um, to report this evening. I want to just report that the City Council voted 4-0 with Council Members Sarmiento, Solario, and Viegas, and Mayor Pro Tem Martinez voting yes to approve two workers' comp cases, one um, title, entitled uh, Garcia on the agenda for the maximum amount of $9,800, and the second one, Russo, in the amount of $26,000. Um, and those same four council members joined by Mayor Polito also approved a settlement in the matter of Maria Quintanilla um, to approve a settlement in the amount of $450,000 by a 5-0 to zero vote. That's all I have to report. Thank you. So with that, um, let me come and we'll begin with consent calendar items. I know I have several speakers. Why don't I take the speakers and then I'll bring it back to council and we'll go from there. Um, 11A and 25D, Ilya. Ilya Tengen, are you here? Ilya, if you're not here, I'm going to move on and go on to um, Richard uh, Garcia, please, on uh, 11B, I, I believe. Richard, are you here? Come on down. And then after Richard, uh, Carmen. Just says Carmen, also on 11B. And then uh, after that will be David Carvajal. Please go ahead, Richard. Hey, uh, good evening, uh, council members and people um, from the council. Um, I'm here in recognition of the food vending ordinance. Um, I, back in February 17th, I wrote a letter to City Council regarding the issues, negative issues that's been going on. We need to see where we can put an ordinance. And we've got to work together with the other agencies. We have to work with the Santa Police Department, and we have to work also with the county. And, and, and all in sequence, especially on the weekends. If we could put something on the weekends regarding a um, uh, weekend food vending surveillance ordinance. We don't have one. Um, we call PD, PD says it's the city's issue, city's issue says it's the county, and we go out in a triangle. We need to close that gap. We need to work together as an issue. I'm not trying to get rid of the food vending vehicles, but we need definitely need to put an ordinance. Uh, due to the fact is that um, some of these vending vehicles are putting restaurants out of business. Uh, because they're open until 1, 2 in the morning. I've seen kids running across the street. I've seen any photos regarding issues on, on, uh, on uh, issues uh, about those requests. So we definitely need to pass this ordinance. Um, like I said, I'm here on behalf of the community for the businesses and food services. Thank so you, thank you very much. Thank you. Carmen? And after that, uh, David Carvajal. Hello, good, uh, good afternoon. Um, 
I am here as a business owner of Santa Ana. I'm also representing the, our building. And um, I, Richard is also helping me to figure out how to handle the situation with the food trucks because it's becoming a, um, it's becoming a um, big issue because we only have, so the address is 1418 North Main Street and I have about four food trucks and about three um, food trucks. And so they literally are blocking all half, half of the sidewalk on either side. And so the Bank of America is right below us and uh, they use all our parking spaces and they basically throw all their trash in the parking structure, within the structure. So um, I, I have spoken to the police department on how to get a hold of the situation because it becomes a liability. Uh, they throw their bottles and then they set up tables and chairs and it becomes like a restaurant outside. So I've been dealing with this for three years and actually it's five years, but three years I've been really trying to figure out what can the city do to help us as business owners to, um, you know, get a hold of the situation. And I approach, I approach the food trucks and I tell them you cannot use a parking structure. You need to, can, you cannot have tables outside and you cannot throw your trash in the facility. But everybody always says, you talk to the city, you talk to the city. And um, I, I don't know what to do about it. Thank you. Thank you for your Thank testimony. You so Mr. Mayor? Yes, if I could just um, go ahead. Make a brief comment to the city attorney. I know that at the last meeting we directed that you continue speaking and trying to negotiate some terms with the vendors and there's different uh, vendor groups out there and there's um, council that represented the vendors back in 2006. So as you go through those discussions, Madam City Attorney, if you could also inject this issue that we've heard, um, and obviously it's a difficult one to tackle because we're talking about right-of-way um, issues and where um, the vendors can, can park, but the proximity to brick and mortar um, businesses are, is real sensitive, just you know, like the safety issue, just like the proximity to um, schools and others. But I think there should be some way that that issue is another term that needs to be negotiated with, um, with the vendors, just so we don't hurt one business to help another, right? We don't want to see our, our food vending trucks go away. We want to be able to work out a good, reasonable system. But we also want to protect our brick and mortar that have to deal with you know, rent and other costs that don't uh, fall to the uh, mobile vending truck. So if there's some way that we can reconcile those um, interests, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, now on item 23A, David Garwahal. Hello. <clears throat> Good evening. Um, I'm here as a resident of Santana tonight to express my opposition to agenda item 23A uh, regarding the improvements to the South Main Corridor. I was looking through the staff report and it doesn't look like there's been an in-depth analysis of the negative impacts this development is going to have on the, south, the community of South Maine. Um, I think a lot of us can refer back to the Renaissance Plan and think of the very adamant opposition of residents. Um, I'm not speaking on behalf of anyone tonight, but I've seen firsthand the violence of displacement um, and the high cost in rents and the criminalization we face because of development that doesn't meet our needs. Uh, the residents of Santana organized and fought for a sanctuary city, but we do not and we cannot live in a sanctuary city when we are being evicted and displaced from our communities. The battle against gentrification is being fought urgently across the nation, and I urge each and every one of you to think of the children and families this project will harm before moving forward with a decision. Thank you, uh, Gil Salmon, followed by Gabby uh, Hernandez. Uh, so, just to be clear, I'm here as a resident of Santa Ana. I'm actually um, in Hanger Park, which is the neighborhood abutting South Main. Um, so, you know, I I just um, I'm I'm hesitating here because I'm trying to react to the last speaker. One of the things for me around this plan is that a huge part of it is around traffic calming, um, and whether you're talking about three girls dying on on a Halloween night 
or a 71-year-old crossing the street from church, we have to do something about that here. So um, to the effect that this plan reduces traffic uh, uh, speeds on that street, introduces bulb outs, uh, creates more safe uh, crossing zones for pedestrians and bicyclists, I'm, I'm fully in favor of that. Um, and I wanted to mention that on the vision plan for that, which isn't included in the staff report, uh, you know, there are bicyclists who are just kind of sprinkled in uh, with zero bicycle infrastructure. Um, so this is one corridor that was uh, uh, um, found to, or, or sort of marked for a bicycle corridor in the safe Santa Ana mobility plan that you all passed. And so from first down to Warner on um, Main, it's supposed to be a bicycle corridor. And so we should be including signs or something in order to make sure that um, that that's safe for bicyclists. And then just lastly, I want to make sure that uh, the Environment and Transportation Commission isn't included anywhere in this as a potential outreach. I want to make sure that that happens. And then also, um, we have no parks in Henninger Park. Um, and I have two children, and there are a ton of kids in the neighborhood. Um, and I'd like for my kids to be able to play with other kids in the neighborhood. And so to the effect that we can include the, the street closure with the creation of open space and parks for uh, the neighborhood on Maine and Warner and Maine and, uh, or sorry, Maine and Walnut and Maine and Pine. Um, I would really appreciate you ensuring that that continues to be a part of this project so that it addresses some of the things that was talked about. Um, you know, one of the, the issues that we have is just, um, you know, neighborhood cohesion. Like, as new residents come into the neighborhood, um, it's really important that um, we invest to make sure people aren't displaced, but also making sure that people can interact with one another and public spaces allow for that. So I appreciate Thank you. It. Thank you, Gabby. And after Gabby, uh, Alan Wu. Tall people, okay. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm, I'm here to talk about 23A um, and to talk about our concerns, uh, Chicano Sonidos, with um, the approval of the engineering process. We've looked at the envisioning map that Santa Ana has, and I think if it was up, if it was up to the city, um, they would have already implemented a lot of those projects that are on this massive map where 4th Street, where all of Santa Ana would look like 4th Street. Um, I hear some people talking about uh, reduction in traffic, some safety concerns, and then uh, this woman that talked about her business. Um, and if you look at this map, a lot of the businesses on this main corridor, main street corridor, would be at risk of displacement. Now, if you have not seen the visioning map, there's buildings going all the way from McFadden all the way down to Warner. The plan is to make four-story and six-story buildings. Now, that's, right now, there's single-story buildings, mom-and-pop shops, and if we start approving these engineering processes, we are really approving now this mass development that will put a lot of these businesses out of business. So when you, Sarmiento, when you talk about protecting businesses, uh, ensure how this will affect future businesses. This is your area and also Martinez's area on, on the Main Street corridor. We already interviewed some families that live on Warner and Maine, and they are being evicted. One of the families has two children with developmental disabilities, and if they are evicted, they will have to leave Santa Ana because they cannot afford to live here anymore. We've talked to other businesses, uh, business owners who are worried about what will happen if this development occurs, and we're wondering if there's any plans to protect these existing businesses. Santa Ana cannot promote itself to be in support of local businesses, existing businesses, if we, there's no protections for them, if the goal is to develop these massive buildings and recruit all these new businesses. Um, I also wanted to say that on, on August 9th, uh, Mayor Polido, you will be getting an award of recognizing uh, during your city address the 100 new businesses that you brought in. I hope that you will also address all the businesses that have been pushed out because of all the gentrification that has already happened in Santa Ana. Thank you. Alan? Hi. Um, Mayor Polito and members of council. I'm here to speak on behalf of the Artish Ballard Neighborhood Association. We want to thank Councilman of the Legas for supporting uh, our donation for $1,000. Um, 
35 years ago, the Artesia Park came together because we had gang problems. We were ravished by redevelopment as it was coming down from the Civic Center. So we formed a neighborhood association. Uh, the result of that over the years has been that uh, we've been able to contain the gang problem in the community by working with our city official. We've been able to get streets done, uh, alleys and all that. And the neighborhood association is a lot stronger now. And we have allies with other neighborhood associations. We work together with Connect to Council. Um, the donation last year uh, did not go through because it fell through the cracks somewhere with the uh, 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 former official. Um, but we thank you for resurrecting it because we really need that resources for several events that we are going to have. We have a street fair coming up with the black community uh, near Prentice Hall. Uh, and it's a community that had been neglected for a long time. And many of the neighborhood leaders that I met, again, were ones that I trained 35 years ago through Sano. And, and it's important to see that they have a voice again. Um, then we have the Posada, which is a very important event for our, our children in the community. We not only walk the neighborhood, uh, but we renew our ties together. Um, and we also hand out toys, which uh, some of the resources from the uh, donation will help. Uh, in addition to that, we're working with groups like uh, Alice Rojas, uh, uh, Ryan Smoller, uh, Chris Schmidt, to, to uh, repaint and revitalize those uh, murals uh, that really put our neighborhood on, on the map. Um, and it came out of an incident uh, where, where there were gang uh, problems in our community shooting. So uh, that's one of the first murals in Santa Ana. And we're going to repaint that. We're going to revitalize and we're going to have a celebration again. So all this, the, the donation will go back to helping the residents engage other residents to work together to solve problems in our community. And it's all been because we have a good working relationship uh, with members of City Council, and we thank you very much for that, and we thank you for, for your support. And thank you for your good work over the decades, Alan. Thank you. You've been doing this well for a long time. Thank you. So with that, I'm going to bring it back to City Council to consider the consent calendar. Uh, Mayor Potem Martinez. Um, I have 11A, 11B, 19D, 19E, 19F, 23A. I'd entertain, is there anybody else? I'd entertain a motion on the balance. So moved. Is there a, those in favor, please say aye. Aye, those opposed, motion carries. Let's go, I think it was 11A. Yes, Mr. Mayor, 11A is an ordinance second reading repealing the reenacting of the uh, municipal code related to water and sewer. And I just had a question just quickly for staff because I did get some phone calls uh, from some residents as it pertains to 11A. If I can just please get an expl explanation that we could put this on the record. 11A, what is the difference between 11A and 75? Um, and 75A, which is essentially 75 that we will be moving for is a public hearing resolution establishing and amending the Santa Ana Municipal Code Chapter 39 water and sewer fees for fiscal year 2017-2018. It's my understanding, and maybe I gave them the wrong information, but we are doing a fee study, and we wanted to look at, um, um, before we even move forward, I just wanted to make sure that what we're doing, because it, 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 are, it said it in the report, that we are going to still be doing a fee study, but are these water and sewer no. uh, fees included in the fee study is, is the question that I have. Uh, well, they will be included in the fee study, but this is changing them from being part of the code is to adopting them by a, a resolution. So by a simple resolution for, by the city council, and how many votes would that need? Is it, is it, a, simple, is it a simple four votes? I would think it would be four votes. Charter, uh, on, charter of course, okay. four votes. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'm going to be a no on this item. Um, All right. So you please. Let me ask uh, is there a motion on the 11A? So moved. I'll go ahead and second. Uh, those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, motion no. carries. One, one no vote. Please note that, uh, Madam Clerk. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, I'm going to turn item uh, 11B over to you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is a, also a second uh, a reading. Um, and, and, and repealing the existing provisions that are involving noncompliance with the state code of regarding the mobile food vending vehicles. And so, since I am chairing this meeting, waiting for the mayor to exit real quickly here before we begin any discussion. We had a first reading, this is the second reading. Is there any comment at this time from my colleagues? 
on this specific item. I do have comment, and so um, if there is no comment from my colleagues, um, I will um, call for the question and and. Um, um, so, so okay, great, thank you. So, I, as a chair, I, I tried my best not to speak first and allow you know the rest of the council to speak. But uh, here on this specific item, I just want to thank some of the uh, folks that um, have come here to address this um, issue in regards to, 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 to their business and also into the neighborhood association as it pertains to you know safety, parking issues, um, and, and and obstructing the public right away. I know that uh, this is just one part uh, of of the issue that we're dealing with here in this ordinance, but I. I I just want to just speak that it is a valid one um, what we're doing here in the second reading and wanting to make sure that we are in, um, in, in, com in compliance with the state but more importantly I think um, you know this city council has asked our staff for 60 more days to do more outreach and outreach and I'm not sure specifically who the outreach was to was it to the business owners or was it specifically to residents or certain business owners that too um, you know may have some issues that they want to address so um, I would just ask the staff who are you uh, actually outreaching to there were three things that we were asked to look at and all of them really would be conversations with the vendors themselves mm -hmm. so tonight we have heard from the businesses uh, we will be back in another 30 days and so we will also add that into uh, our outreach and talking about what problems they have and how we can address them in the the new ordinance this is repealing the old ordinance Correct. this evening the new ordinance that we bring back for the council's deliberation and consideration mm -hmm. Thank you for clarifying that, Ms. Staten Manager, because I, I know specifically the council asked to have conversations directly with the vendors and not with others that uh, may have had issues specifically uh, issues addressing um, as it pertains to the food produce or food trucks that uh, certain residents and certain businesses um, within the, um, those neighborhoods also are facing issues and, and would like to be heard as well. And so I think we need a balanced approach. I, I think you all know my, my position here, but um, this city council did support a 60-day continuance. And so what we're doing here today Day is just uh, again repealing um, the um, the old one and moving forward to with state codes regarding the mobile vending vehicles of article of chapter 36 of the Santa Ana Municipal Code. So I'll go ahead and call for the question. Do we have a, Do we have a motion? We have a first by Mr. Solorio, second. second by uh, Sarmiento. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Mr. Mayor, you may come in. So as he is coming in, the next item is 19D. And just very quickly, because I've been receiving a lot of emails from certain folks as it pertains to capital improvement um, projects. And Fred, just if we just could state for the record that we can find, and maybe maybe it's not, but I'm assuming that this that the CIP report is online. Is that if it's not online, how can we get that on there? Because I think a lot of constituents and residents are asking when a specific projects are going to be completed. Some of them have been in the queue um, and they haven't seen any progress. Others have said that um, city staff has decided not to fund those. The, the, those projects are not being funded. They're not moving, being moving forward. And so for clarification, because I know what we're doing here is just a receiving file from the Public Works Agency on our monthly CIP. I know we get these reports, but you know, how does the public um, get informed about all capital improvement projects that are occurring throughout the city? Thank you, Mayor, members of Council. Yes, the report is online, supposed to be. It's, it's updated every month, and it will show uh, updated information on all CIP projects that we have in-house. Uh, obviously, things changes due to funding and grant funding delays uh, uh, due to changes that that happens out of our control. That's why we we'll try to reflect that uh, every month. So I would just request um, because I, I think maybe not everyone is able to go online or find it because you know our, our website. You know, sometimes I have difficulty looking for certain um, documents. And, and they may not be able to get that to that specific document, but how can we do a better job, Ms. City Manager, of how we communicate with the public as it pertains to these infrastructure projects? Because I think whether it's our parks or whether it's a, a, a street improvement or, or other road improvements like bridges that have been in the queue for quite some time, 
folks will circle back with the council and ask us, well, where are you at? Or they've tabled this off. How can we do a better job in possibly providing to the general public beyond them going to the website about some of these projects that are in the pipeline, going to get completed or are not going to get completed because of funding? Uh, I, I won't have a comprehensive af answer this evening. Uh, I think it is important to let people know when new projects are starting, um, maybe when really large projects that we've been talking about in, in this room or mm -hmm. in community meetings get delayed. Uh, we've talked a little bit about a newsletter, an online newsletter, and how we might communicate better with our constituents. might be that that would be a regular column in a monthly uh, letter. So not saying any of those things are the app actual answer but all ideas that we have thought about and we'll put more thought into yeah and, and and i just state that because you know there are specific residents that are very active and that are communicating with council members and we're going back and forth with all the 49 staff members and council members in the emails and maybe other folks in the public will also want this information so just wanted us to bring that and then lastly on sb1 i uh, just want to thank you and and your staff for putting that together as it pertains to um the projects that are going to be um coming before us for the funding uh, which is very important and then maybe how do we put that out in a newsletter that you know with the SB fund SB one funding these are the projects that the city is proposing to the state to get funded as well um, I think just not just the council getting that memo I think the public wants to uh, as well know what those projects are sure and with that mr. mayor move the item forward I'll second the item. Those in favor, please say aye. Aye. I suppose the motion carries. And Fred, if you can get me some of that information that uh, Mayor Pro Tem just requested before the state of the city, it might be appropriate to, uh, to mention some of that. Thank you. So with that, what's next? Thank you. Next, uh, Mr. Mayor, is 19E, which is also a receiving file for strategic plan. And this is just for the city manager's office. Had a very quick question. Um, as we updated our budget, and I thank you for always putting this report, I didn't see the attachment on the um, um, on, on our um, system here. Um, as I try to click, so I just want to uh, make 19E. There was no attachment. Um, and the... But just based on this report, based on the approval of, of, of this fiscal budget, is there going to be any changes to the strategic planning in the five-year phase? Are we still going to continue to fund what we uh, committed to? Or are there any changes to that five-year strategic plan as it pertains to the funding that was available? Council, we're not talking about any changes uh, now. We're going to talk about proceeding as the council's already adopted it. Fantastic. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem, I'd yeah. just like to report that the strategic plan is available through uh, the website. So the report is a link that's provided, um, and the link will be um, added to the agenda packet after at the end of the meeting. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Is that a motion? That, that's a motion to move forward. Thank is you. Is there a second? Second. Those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Aye, those opposed, motion carries. Next item. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I asked to bring this forward, and I'm not sure if my colleagues were able to uh, have the opportunity to read this, but to receive and file in regards to the Arts and Culture Commission annual report. Um, and thank you, Jorge, for doing a great job in articulating all the work that this Art and Culture Commission has done. I asked for this report to come before us because we established this commission about three years ago. And um, yet nothing has come to us. What have they done? I know that we've been approving many grants. They, 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 they have now a new chair and a vice chair, and they've made changes. And you know, they've, they've participated in various other activities and, and working with the community and moving uh, with arts and culture. But when we first established that, and one of the reasons why I supported it was that we wanted to have a conversation, one, about the placemaking. And, and, and I saw that it was on there. And hopefully, we continue to move forward with that but more importantly was the sister cities that was one of the reasons and um, one of the biggest conversations that we had on this dais that beyond just some of the duties of, of the basic um, recommendations of, of those many grants these um, the pilot project of the of, of the different um, 
uh, outlets of Edison, the what do they call the utility boxes, and 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 uh, that we wanted to talk about sister cities. And I, I don't know where we're at. It's three years later, I know there was conversations. I I, I had a meeting with uh, the new chair, Pocha Pena, now, and and we talked. And I asked her, said, you know, hey, where are you? Where are we at with the sister cities program? That's one of the things that we discuss. We're one of the only few cities um, in Orange County and even in California that doesn't even have a sister city, especially being a city. City of, of, of our size and so uh, we had uh, had that conversation with the prior uh, city manager and its staff and so I would just like to know where are we with that it wasn't mentioned um, in the report or maybe I bypassed it um, I was more looking at the activities that occurred maybe it was in there and, and, and I overlooked it but uh, I, I know there was some initial conversations um, but then it just ended and so what 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 because it, it never came back to the City Council uh, uh, what we were going to do next sure Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem, uh, Mayor, members of the City Council. As far as the Sister Cities program goes, um, the Commission has had several conversations over the last three years on the program, whether it would be through the formal Sister Cities International Group, uh, which the City did pay dues for two years ago. Um, following that um, action, um, staff looked at reevaluating the Sister Cities program because there was no criteria set yet. Was it just a cultural exchange? Were we looking at economic development? Um, so in December, a subcommittee was formed uh, in order to further look at the Sister Cities program. Uh, subsequent to that, there has not been much movement. Um, I have met with many of the commissioners in my one-on-one -on -one meetings with them to discuss the program and uh, steps moving forward. That is one of the items for movement this year as a discussion item. We can definitely bring uh, an update back to the Mayor and City Council um, once we've had some dialogue with the commissioners. Uh, but the commission has had various um, ideas on whether we want a formal program, an informal program, and what that looks like. So we can definitely come back and, and provide the commission, uh, the city council some information on that. The reason it wasn't included um, is it's not an exhaustive list of all of the activities, and because there wasn't a lot of movement last year, uh, we didn't want to highlight that as an achievement or an accomplishment of the commission. It's just something in the future for, you know, because this city council specifically, that was one of the action items for this commission. As you all know, the commission is an advisory to this council, and specifically, we did make a, and pinpoint that we wanted to address the sister cities, the placemaking. We embarked in an arts culture, an arts master plan that I know they got fulfilled that was brought back here. The last thing that we want is now three years in the making. Um, you know, is this commission working? Is it not working? You know, we. we Maybe we can hear back and get feedback um, to making sure that we're investing our dollars uh, appropriately, not just this council, just supporting many grants, but then just letting. But we also want to hear from the chairs of, of each of the commissions, specifically like the Arts and Culture Commission, to get their feedback and, and, and how can we be helpful and communicate with one another of how we can move the city forward. Um, because I know our commissioners have a lot of great ideas that sometimes are not being shared to this council, and that I think that you know we need to continue to hear from from them and 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 have them hear from us as well I know there's thank more you Let, yeah there's more comment let's try to limit comment to our to our allotted time oh you should um, uh, Councilmember Sarmiento I'm very passionate about this issue thank you mr. mayor and yeah speaking about passion I know that um, I want to thank staff because you have a lot of passionate arts and culture committee members <laughs> right so they're very busy they're very active we see them all over and sometimes I think we see them that you know they tax our time or they're exhausting but you know, when you look at other cities, they're completely dormant, right? We have a very active arts community, and so that's a really good thing um, when you think about it. And I know that they sometimes call, you know, Mayor Pro Tem, they call me, they call others on the council because they're so excited about a grant that's out there, an opportunity that they're looking at, other communities that are doing exciting things. And, you know, when we chose to um, extend the committee status to this topic, it was because we placed a high value on arts and culture in our community. So um, that was a good thing. And I think that, you know, any community uh, as diverse as ours, um, as, um, you know, that places such a high value on culture has to have something like this. So to the extent we can deal with, you know, some of their requests a little bit better, um, it is always helpful because these are folks that are taking time out of their busy schedules to devote um, their skill set to things that are important. On sister cities, I know that when I sat down and spoke with a few of the members and with the Mexican consulate's office, 
There was um, talk about Guanajuato, which is a beautiful city, and I think a lot of folks felt strongly about that. One of the things I had asked some of the members and the Mexican consul to consider is what are the demographics of the city? In other words, what states from Mexico and other countries are the largest in population here in town? Um, and I know that uh, you know Michoacan is a very large state that's represented in, in the city, Guerrero, and I think the state of Mexico. So, um, so to the extent that those things are part of the decision making if we do go forward with sister city um, you know codifying those relationships or establishing those relationships it's really important to find out where are folks from right because there's a natural nexus there that we can use for there to be an exchange of um, culture ideas business um, so that's why and I know back then some of the states that I mentioned were going through some difficult uh, moments, um, you know, with crime and violence, and so I think that's what dissuaded a lot of the relationships. But you know, maybe now is a good time to revisit it that we're talking about. So. Thank you for staying at the time limit, uh, Council Colonial. <laughs> yes, uh, that was just coincident. No, it was yeah. very good. Then. I think I think the idea that the council had for creating this commission was great, and I'm, I'm glad you all did it. Um, and. I like the idea of reports, but like uh, Mayor Porte Martinez mentioned, it'd be nice to every now and then have the, you know, the physical chairperson uh, come and, and say some words. And we really don't have that many commissions that maybe, I don't know how we discuss it or maybe staff could think through it, but it might be nice to like once a month have, you know, one commission give, give a report. I think that would give a real f good flavor for what they're all doing because quite frankly, uh, Although we get a lot of paper and emails, uh, we don't really know what they're struggling with or what their big victories have been or how we may be able to support them further. So um, I do like the idea of maybe starting with the Arts uh, Commission. So thank you. Thank, thank you for those comments. I believe we have a, a motion. A motion. Forward, Mayor. And a second. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries 23A. The, yes, my final one, Mayor, and I'll be quick. The, can you put the time on just very quickly because I know this is Council, more Councilman Sarmiento's war, but I just wanted to pull this item and I just want to thank my Commissioner Gila for coming and that's exactly why I wanted to talk specifically was on this issue, was on the traffic calming issues. Um, which are very important. If you look at um, South Maine, and, and I know we've had many discussions, myself and Councilman Sarmiento, with a, with, a, um, with a lot of the residents, whether they're from Wilshire Square or they're from the east side, and also the association uh, for, you know, I think our 11 years, we've discussed um, this specific uh, plan and didn't have the funding and all kinds of issues uh, roles, and I think Councilman Sarmiento will speak on that, so I won't go all into that. But um, I, I just want to make sure that we're able to connect the dots. We have plans here. We're moving with this plan here. We have the Vision Zero. We're specifically, we know that's a high incident corridor. We have a lot of activity there. Um, as we look at that planning, and I just sent a grant um, to staff in regards to the Sustainable Community um, Affordable Housing Grant. If you look at that area, um, the the bus system, the rapid bus system, um, specifically for OCTA, is a is a high corridor right there for 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 Main Street. You can connect that for sustainable community and transit. It doesn't have to be near a train a train station. And so, looking at that rapid bus uh, network on Main, we would be able to apply. And um, I really believe that it's important for us. And I want to thank some of the members of the audience that did come. Is that we don't want to display Small forks, and one of the reasons why I didn't support Warner is for that reason: is that we already have a housing crisis. We have a, a huge amount of homelessness issues here, and and you know the more and more we continue to expand our roads or bring in different developments, we have to keep in mind that the people that already live here, the businesses that are already here, how can we accommodate them, bring them into the fold? And I know that's something that South Maine and many of the of, of the associations have been doing as well. And so I just want to let the public know that but again I want to make sure too that there's conversations that ETAC is able to participate they are part of the transportation um, you know that that's part of the of the of ETAC and what they do and I really believe that we need to include our commissioners as much as we possibly can and I know that sometimes it takes a lot of work from our staff but there's a lot of things that this council doesn't see and it comes at the 11th hour for us to approve it's always great to have these folks that are really volunteering their time 
to, to go to these meetings and learn about the community and sharing information. And so if we can include them, it'd be greatly appreciated. Also include uh, um, members of, 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 of our community that have interest in wanting to make sure that we have sustainable communities. And with that, Mr. Mayor, thank you very much. Thank you for the comments. Uh, Council Senator Sarmiento, please. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think um, Mayor Pro Tem said it all. Uh, you know, the only concern was I know we had a speaker that came up and said, you know, is this an effort to try to, you know, gentrify or push po folks out? Just the contrary. I think one of the reasons and one of the underlying reasons for me, in addition to the good traffic calming efforts, um, efforts to make it a much safer uh, corridor because we do have a lot of families that live very close to that corridor and young kids that cross Main to get to elementary school or um, you know or to high school so um, we also saw that there was displacement going on on 4th Street right as the rents became higher uh, folks couldn't afford to be on 4th Street. Their quinceanera, quinceanera shops had to close. You know, restaurants, other forms of businesses had to close. Well, we saw that the rents in South Main were lower, right? So those were opportunities to try to retain those businesses and give them an opportunity of where they could go in town and still keep them here in Santa Ana because many of them, once, once they're displaced, they go elsewhere. They go outside the city. South Main would have been a natural place, as we saw it, as a magnet for them to go ahead and recreate um, a critical mass of businesses where they can still continue to operate and not have too much of an impact on their clientele. So that was, you know, one of the reasons. Just to the contrary, we thought if we could create more foot traffic, you introduce some residentials, you introduce some other um, amenities there, we create a community that's much, much um, more dense. There's more commerce going on. And I know the existing businesses there saw South Main as just a pass-through corridor where cars would just get from Irvine to the south um, or Costa Mesa to the south to Orange on, on the north, right? So they'd just be going back and forth. By traffic calming, we slow folks down, they get out of their cars, they shop in the businesses, they eat at the restaurants, and it helps commerce in our town. I know it doesn't help regional traffic, but it helps our residents, and that's what our priority should be. So um, that's why I think, you know, we looked at this, you know, carefully. Um, you know, I'm not sure, Mr. Mayor, how the Transit Authority or OCTA looks at this because they need as many corridors that get traffic moving, and we understand that. But we also realize that we have to protect our stakeholders who are in town who are trying to make a living and do business as well. So, Thank you. Point well taken. Any other comment on this item? I'll make a motion to approve. Is there a second? Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries. Madam Clerk, I believe now we have oath of offices. Yes, if I can have Shirley Munir and Vince Frazier come to the front, please. To, um, they will be sworn in as Youth Commissioner and Community Redevelopment Commission member, respectively. Do they know what they're getting into? <laughs> I, Shirley Minier, do solemnly swear to support and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I take this obligation freely, without any mental reservation, or purpose of evasion, that I will well and face faithfully discharge the duties from which I am about to enter. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. I've been Fra excuse me. I Vince Frazier do solemnly swear to support and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation 
for a purpose of evasion. And I will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I'm about to enter. Congratulations. Congratulations to both of you. We look forward to your service, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy your respective uh, commissions. So with that, I want to bring our attention to item 55A. 55B. All right, right now we're on A. I would entertain a motion. This is a resolution supporting the California Water Fix and California Echo Restore projects. Uh, I'll move the item, but I think we have a member of the audience who wishes to, uh, to say a couple comments about the resolution, Water Fix, if you... Director Barber. Director. Absolutely. Come on down. He's a director from WD, and, and so am I, and, but uh, of course, always good to hear from him. I think he has three hats. Is it the Met, MODOC, and one other I hear? Uh, Met Modoc and the Yorba Land of Water there District, go, so I do it. quite a bit. So Welcome. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Um, I'll make this very quick because if the votes are there, I'll just shut up and go to the back. But I just, I just want to say on behalf of the Municipal Water District of Orange County, we really enjoy up at Met working with uh, Council Member uh, Martinez, um, Interim City Manager is Cynthia Kurtz. Uh, we work very closely with the three cities, uh, Fullerton and, and Anaheim. And the California fix is so critical for the long-term uh, reliability for Southern California. I know uh, Councilmember uh, Solario, when he was in Sacramento, was a great leader on water issues, and he understands better than most the importance there. And also Councilman uh, Sarmiento is on the Orange County Water District. We work very closely uh, together to ensure water reliability for the residents of Santa Ana. So I would encourage uh, strong support for this. And uh, we will be voting at Met on this in September. So, and so. thank you for your leadership on all these different issues that affect so many millions of people. Thank you. Thank you, Brett. So, with that, uh, more comment, we'll Councilor Sarmiento. Be a second. Um, yeah, I made a motion. Got yeah. it. Any uh, additional comment, Councilor Solario? Uh, yes, uh, I, I, start do, the I, clock, I do. Start the clock, Madam Clerk. <laughs> I do want to thank. Uh, time, go. I do want to thank staff for, for bringing this forward. I know uh, Mayor Pote Martinez and Council Member Sarmiento have been doing a lot uh, in in this uh, project area, and you know the water fix is something you know we need. It's to have you know sustainable water to keep coming from the Sacramento Delta area uh, through the Central Valley down to. Uh, Southern California, so we really uh, need it, and more than anything else, this provides us reliability uh, in an environmental way. Uh, but also, we need to continue to work at the local level on more regional and interregional projects. I know uh, both the members I, I mentioned are also uh, very behind that idea. In that, you know, we can't always rely on on the Delta, or there may be uh, uh, an earthquake up there. I know Mayor Portin Martinez says it's not if, it's when uh, it's coming. And if that happens, you know, the Delta area will really get uh, salinated and the water will not be of drinkable quality for months or potentially years. So for those reasons and the issues with the Colorado River, we do need to have uh, ongoing uh, sustainable water sources here uh, in Orange County, Southern California. Uh, and... We need to work with the resources that we have. I know uh, our water district's also looking at various options there, too. So I'm very supportive and thank the staff for bringing this forward. So we've already had motion to second comment. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries. Now item 55B, we have several speakers, so we'll hear from the speakers and then we'll bring it to council. Alan, you're first. Alan Wu. Followed by Madeline Spencer. Get ready, Madeline. Um, what I'd like to uh, first thank uh, Michelle and, and uh, City Manager Kurtz for supporting our uh, uh, planning session with Jane Rojas on Latino urbanism. I bring that as an introduction because we were able to begin to understand how culture and art really influences how people have impression of the community. Um, I know when I looked at some of the pictures that James put up there, I went kind of like, yuck! You know, I didn't like wrought iron fences, but 
I began to understand why they had that. I began to understand why people uh, turned their uh, backyard into the front yard. I also began to understand and remember studies I did on the underground economy and also um, uh, the studies I did at Community Action Partnership before I retire on poverty in Santa Ana. And that there has always been a vibrant, and I say vibrant, uh, ex underground economy of those below the low-income uh, community, and particularly among the immigrant population, that they're not consumer social services because they're not eligible. They make their own economy to support their family. And that's an important notion to understand how people survive in this city are part of the ec economy and part of the fabric. And there got to be a place for them, and I think that this um, um, resolution begins the process of understanding that. On the other side, there are people like me that are trying to bring in $600 million for other kinds of development along the way, and now I'm a little more sensitive in making sure that that does not displace people, but we can incorporate that. So I think that um, I'm learning, whereas when I first came to Santa Ana, I thought the city was an adversarial place and people weren't very nice, and I'm glad to learn that when, when I went through the process of trying to get a uh, organization off the ground, Jorge and uh, people at the 6th floor and 8th floor were very helpful, friendly, and navigated, helping navigate us through all the different forms and, and stuff that I have to do. So my impression of the planning department and everything has kind of changed from the days where I had to come here and, and, and shout and yell. But, but, um, but I also realized that we've got much more to do because there are poor people in the city. Uh, by the number of people on Medi-Cal. So we need to begin something to bring jobs to people, to our youth, uh, to our people out there that support family. Thank you, Alan. Uh, and if you need any help, we'd like to bring people together and money to talk about that. Thank you. Madeline, followed by Esther Hernandez. Good evening, Council and City staff. I'm very excited to see this on the agenda. Um, as a capital city, Santa Ana has shown that it has very widespread and deep-seated problems as related to its need for economic restructuring in order to stabilize itself, to stop capital flight that has plagued the city for decades and left us with myriad scenarios of haunting familiarity plaguing multiple sectors that include not only our residents, but also our departments of planning, housing, development, economic and education, as well as our civic government and urban practitioners who work within the city. To awaken our communities from its continued nightmares related to immigrant status, unemployment, poverty, homelessness, lack of affordable housing, and the rampant pro proliferation of illegitimate business practices that run that are run often by ingenious and inventive individuals reaching for a means of stabilization and survival through System D, or what's otherwise known as our black market economy, we will require transformative change. While our Chamber of Commerce and business leaders, city planners, and government officials have always offered a range of cookie cutter solutions, such as seeking reform for the workforce development programs, creating top-down sectorial strategies, or seeking from outside the city to bring in a creative class with strategies of new urbanism, for all of the fanfare that greets these solutions, when our cities implement them, they're regularly perpetuating traditional strategies for economic growth, which are mischaracterized as economic development strategies. Typically, these strategies fall instead under an umbrella of an export-based model, as well as assumptions inherent in the global paradigm of neoliberalism. As such, they're rooted in assumptions about mobility of capital and desirability and efficiency of competition and the duty of places to compete for the affectations and benefits of these footloose economic engines. Cooperative development, on the other hand, makes an instrumental contribution to a transformational city-wide economic change through three primary pathways. An economic pathway that alleviates poverty and stimulates economic growth, a democratic pathway providing a framework for democratic participation, and a social pathway building social capital and trust for all of our community. Thank you. If you could conclude, Madeline. Thank you. Take care. Uh, Esther Hernandez, Fava Luz Maria Martinez. 
And after that, uh, Carlos Melendez. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes a todos. Eh, mi nombre es Esther Hernández y soy miembro de una cooperativa llamada Manos Unidas Creando Arte y que nació a raíz de, de mi necesidad por ayudar a mi esposo que tiene tres trabajos este, y poder aportar algo a mi familia. Para mí fue una oportunidad como ama de casa que no tenía pues una manera de cómo ayudar, ¿verdad? Y pues a mí me gustaría que ustedes este, nos apoyaran para nosotros poder progresar como cooperativas, dando lugares, oportunidades para también contribuir a esta ciudad, para que no seamos una de las familias desplazadas y para también no ser una carga pública, como dicen a veces. Entonces, para mí es importante que ustedes nos puedan apoyar. Gracias. Gracias. Good evening, my name is Esther Hernandez. I'm, I'm with a cooperative, uh, United Moms uh, Creating Art, and uh, we need your help. Uh, and, and I needed to help, uh, this cooperative is important because I needed to help my husband who works three jobs and to support the family. And uh, I saw this as an opportunity as a homemaker uh, because I have no other, way, uh, to, uh, no other way to help. So I'm asking you to support us to succeed as a cooperative uh, so that we can uh, make this a better, uh, better city. Uh, and contribute to the city so that we are not th those displaced families or we are not, as they say, a public burden. So please, uh, it's important for you to support us. Thank you, Luz, Maria, followed by Carlos Melendez, followed by Ana Ursua. So, buenas tardes. Um, mi nombre es Luz María Martínez y estoy aquí para la resolución en el apoyo para las cooperativas. Estoy aquí para pedir el apoyo para mi comunidad uh, emprendedora. Estamos buscando una forma de ser autosuficientes económicamente. So, desafortunadamente no tuvimos la educación antes de estar aquí. Más sin embargo, estamos buscando esa oportunidad a través de las cooperativas. Um, ha sido difícil para mí crear un negocio, lo he estado en la búsqueda durante años, más sin embargo, la limitación económica independiente, solo mía, es, no es suficiente para crear un negocio. So, hay muchas trabas para nosotros, uh, en especial los que carecemos de capital, más sin embargo, tenemos el deseo de crecer y de aportar a la economía, a nuestras familias cosa que un empleo común con un salario mínimo no es sustentable. So, esa es nuestra iniciativa como emprendedores. Um, hay muchos uh, obstáculos para ser empresarios o pequeños negocios, eh, principalmente por, la, por el capital. Hay muchas obstrucciones para poder obtener un financiamiento y por eso me, me apoyo a una cooperativa, porque un grupo de personas se reúnen Uh, tienen el mismo sueño, la misma visión, la misma intención de aportar y generamos cierta cantidad de dinero y podemos crear cosas diferentes juntos, cosa que independientemente es más difícil si no tienes el capital suficiente. So, por eso estoy aquí, para pedir su apoyo, para que se den la oportunidad de conocernos y nosotros conocerlos a ustedes, de alguna manera interactua, interactuar, para poder llegar a ser prósperos y ser aportación para nuestras familias y para la comunidad. So, el propósito de crear una cooperativa es ser autosuficiente, manteniendo las familias prósperas, ayudando a, a la comunidad a ser económicamente libres, no depender tanto de las aportaciones de la, o de la caridad de la, de la ciudad, en este caso. Uh, lo más importante para mí es ser aportación para mi comunidad y por eso estoy aquí, parada por ellos, porque habemos muchas personas que tenemos el deseo de emprender un negocio, más siempre los obstáculos están ahí y queremos hacer la diferencia. Luz María, gracias, ya está roja la luz, gracias. Gracias. 
Good evening, my name is Luz Maria Martinez, and I'm here uh, the, in the support of the resolution to, uh, to support the cooperatives. We are from the community, and this is a way for us to be self-sufficient. Uh, we did not have the opportunity to get a formal education before coming, to, coming here, but this is an opportunity to the to cooperative. Uh, it's very difficult to open up our own businesses. I've been trying for years. Uh, it's, it's if, even with my independent uh, uh, creativity, it's not enough. It's difficult because we lack the monies to get started, and uh, we want to help our families to create jobs, and, and a, a job is not enough to help our families uh, prosper. There are many obstacles as uh, uh, to start a business, one of them being a lack of money or financing. A co cooperative model is better because we create things together, we get together, we have the same dreams, the same vision, and we create things together for the benefit of all. And so we'd like to have your support it's for you to get to know us, for us to get to know you, so that together we can prosper as a community. The, pro the purpose of uh, cooperatives is to be self-sufficient and to have uh, prosperous families in a better economy. So please, we'd like to have uh, your support for our co the cooperative. Thank you. Gracias. Now, uh, Carlos. Buenas tardes, señores. Señor alcalde, señores concejales. Mi nombre es Carlos Meléndez. Soy miembro de una cooperativa de aquí de Santa Ana también. Y vengo a apoyar a mis compañeras que han pasado antes para pedirles también el apoyo de ustedes en esta intención que tenemos de hacer cooperativas, ¿verdad? Eh, personalmente yo pienso que las cooperativas es una forma de poder acceder a, al comercio, al negocio, ¿verdad? A nivel personal hemos probado algunas veces y no, no nos ha sido difícil, por lo que dijo la compañera anterior, la falta de capital y la incapacidad que tenemos nosotros algunos de acceder a la banca eh, normal, porque no calificamos por diferentes razones. Entonces hemos visto una puerta abierta en el cooperativismo y estamos este, pensando utilizarlo y pedirles el apoyo de ustedes, ¿verdad? Eh, en días pasados el concejal Solorio ya manifestó su apoyo a la cooperativa de mujeres MUCA y yo espero que esta noche él materialice también el apoyo al grupo de cooperativas que estamos queriendo formarnos. También eh, entiendo de que la presión económica y social es grande en una ciudad como la nuestra y que si se nos da la oportunidad de participar en el comercio, en el negocio, eso con el tiempo puede relajar un poco esa presión económica y social y vamos a tener mejores familias en esta ciudad. Por eso les pido el apoyo y muchas gracias. Uh, good evening, my name is Carlos Maldonado, and I'm here as a, a member of cooperative, and I ask your support, and I'm here to support the other uh, ladies who spoke about the cooperatives as well. I think a cooperative is a better, gives us better access to uh, starting a, a business, to having a business. Uh, as an individual, it's not easy uh, to open up a business because of lack of funds, uh, lack of access to banking services for different uh, reasons. A cooperative opens many doors so uh, for us to do this. So, so we ask for your support. Um, Mr. Solorio, Councilman Solorio uh, recently supported women in a cooperative and, and that was great. So I, we ask for the rest of you to support this, uh, this as well. Uh, the city has great uh, needs and if, the cooperative, if you help the cooperatives to get to flourish, uh, then we would have better families in this city and so we ask for your support. Anna, you're next. Good evening. My Anna, name is Anna Ursula. Notice your new haircut. Oh yeah, thanks. <laughs> Summertime. Uh, my name is Ana Ursua, director of the Santana Building Healthy Communities, and I'm here to commend the council for taking on this topic, Mayor Pro Tem for bringing it to the attention of your colleagues, and Mark Morley at the Department of Economic Development for all of his work. Uh, as you know, the organizations, adults, and youth residents of building healthy communities know that in order to see transformations in the community's conditions of health, we have to address problems at the root. And income inequality is one of the deadliest. And so a commitment to residents of our community has to look like concrete measures to invest in and support the needs of our most marginalized communities. Worker cooperatives is a step in the right direction. 
Worker cooperatives are businesses owned by its workers. They are autonomous associations of persons united voluntarily to meet their common economic, social, and cultural needs and aspirations through a jointly owned and democratic controlled, democratically controlled enterprise. Worker cooperatives support community wealth building by creating long-term stable jobs, have sustainability, sustainable practices, and are connected and accountable to their communities. At a worker cooperative, profits, rather than going to distant investors, in, instead go directly to the workers themselves. As a result, the money stays grounded in the local economy, building community wealth and contributing to our city's economic developments. We understand the numerous benefits of cooperatives, both firsthand and nationwide. We have seen cooperatives are a successful strategy. We are connected to a network of cooperatives nationwide, including the United States Federation of Worker Cooperatives and the Democracy at Work Institute. Locally, we are working with Cielo at the, the Santa Ana Building Healthy Communities. They are a technical assistance provider supporting the business development of, of worker cooperatives. Um, but most importantly, we're laying the groundwork for a co worker cooperative network run by residents of our city, where they can make possible the various um, uh, the various um, supports necessary for shared prosperity, including reducing barriers to business licensing, accessing loans such as CDBG, and incentives for city procurements and others. We urge you for your support in economic development that invests in our communities and provides opportunities for all to thrive. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. With that, I'll bring it back to uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Um, I don't have to say anything. Anna did an amazing job in articulating what a worker cooperative is, and I just also want to thank Anna, the Building Healthy Communities, and of course our local worker cooperatives that are here. Um, I've been a big uh, supporter, and as we all know, that worker cooperatives is not a new concept. It's been around for a very long time. But just to give you a, a, not only the local examples here in Santa Ana, but at a at a at a bigger scale. You you know, here in Orange County, Rainbow, who was a trash hauler in Huntington Beach that merged with um, a bigger trash hauler, was a cooperative. And when they sold to, to that other trash hauler, many of those employees um, left in, in being millionaires, which is very cool. And so that's just one great example at a, at a bigger scale. And we're not really looking at doing something like that. We're really here at the ground level with our actual residents. But then if you even look in, 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 in the East Coast and you look at Chobani, right? Chibani, how many of you have had Chobani yogurt? That's a worker cooperative, mm -hmm. right? Owned by its employees, right? Not stockholders or shareholders, right? Who are not there every day doing the work. But it's the people making the decisions, you know, that, you know, the, and I always tell folks that if you're not at the table, you're going to be on the menu, right? And so it's so important that we have our residents that are willing to, to, to move forward towards upward mobility and look at ways to do worker cooperatives so that they can not only invest within their own families and help support their families but help support our community as the money continues to reinvest here and so one of the reasons I brought it's no different than capitalism and small businesses of the system that we have here in place here but we need to put a, a system in place that supports and really cultivates you know worker cooperatives you know we have micro grants that we've we've contributed to small business of five thousand dollars why wouldn't these worker cooperatives be able to participate so that's just one great example in, in regards to the procurement process, they would have to be adjusted to making sure that they too would be able to contribute. And this is not subsidizing, you know, worker cooperatives, because I would just say too as well. So we've subsidized the Chamber of Commerce, we subsidize these small businesses like Downtown Inc. And, and, and these other businesses that are legit. No, it's really trying to bring everyone to the fold and it's really commendable of, of the specific worker cooperatives that have already started here without asking the city for assent or moving us towards um, um, the direction where we can provide incentives to help them thrive. And so, Mr. Mayor, I'm definitely supportive. Um, the only thing that I would just add is that if we, I'm not sure how, what time frame, I would say 60, but if our staff needs 90 days to go out and continue to work with um, 
with um, Anna and the others that they have been talking to, then bring it back to the council committee uh, to flush out these options and then bring it um, fully back to the city council. I want to follow the process. And so that would be my only recommendation, but I full uh, heartily support it. 60 or 90 days? We prefer 90. This 90. is a new territory for us. We want to get it right. So 90 days. All right, make that your motion. Um, uh, so I, I move uh, to move this forward uh, for 90 days, go out into the community, have conversations, and then bring it back to the council is committee. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> we got it. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 You have comment? I have comments. One already voted. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go well, ahead, Jose. Um, I want to thank uh, the, the staff and the council members that, that, that brought this forward. Um, I very much support this uh, concept. And I don't know if it will be part of this process or related processes, but I think as we develop new processes like this, we got to have some flexibility in that the uh, e economy is creative. These 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 type of organizations are, are creative, and so they all don't really fit into one one structure. Uh, for example, there's uh, related concepts out there like micro enterprises. Uh, we have trade associations. We also have a lot of home based businesses. Uh, that we, I think, got to support, and I think there's a lot of confusion in our community about if you're a home-based business, can you have one, can you not, do you need a business license, don't you, can you have a home base and an external business, um, as well as, you know, many small cooperatives, organizations start out of the home. Mm -hmm. And so we got to uh, acknowledge that, you know, we're also moving more into a shared economy and that whole uh, world is evolving. So as we do things like this, I just want us to build enough flexibility in the in the language so that we're not so myopic that, that we miss out on, on, on helping uh, others. And then as part of this, uh, let's also consider developing templates for how to do these things well, because I've seen some cooperatives that work well. I've seen some cooperatives that don't. I see some that fail. I see some where only the people at the top uh, succeed, and, I, and I've seen everything in between. Uh, also, I know, I know what was mentioned was the concept of profit sharing, uh, and that's something that I do want to see, whether it's a cooperative or just a, a general business, so that's a good concept to support. Uh, and then uh, Alan Wu also mentioned uh, the underground economy. And I think anything we could do to legitimize work uh, and give folks in the system to benefit for themselves in the community uh, is a great thing. And that also reduces exploitation uh, in the community. Uh, and then finally, you know, there's many in our community that are still looking for, for legal work. And uh, sometimes these cooperatives or related uh, enterprises can uh, be an avenue to for that, hopefully one day be an avenue for comprehensive immigration reform uh, and opportunities for um, tax uh, ID numbers, et cetera. So I'm very supportive and uh, look forward to seeing our economy grow, businesses large and small. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Vince Sarmiento, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I'm also very supportive of this, and I want to thank um, the speakers who came before us and um, uh, Mayor Pro Tem for bringing this and staff for doing good work on this. You know, what we're basically doing is we're recognizing what already exists, right? Um, we have a lot of very creative, very entrepreneurial um, people in town that for one reason or another couldn't be part of the traditional workforce, so they find a way to survive just to not be a burden on, um, you know, public services so or uh, general services. So we, I think, are doing, making a good step here to recognize that and to try to be supportive um, as supportive as we can. These same folks who um, are very entrepreneurial um, are folks who are underbanked and unbanked. And I know we've been trying to make an effort to try to get folks in so they can be eligible for micro loans and get um, more banking services because they get preyed on by these check cashing uh, companies that just, you know, uh, have an outrageous, um, you know, cost for just cashing a simple check. And so those are things that we're trying to eliminate here as well. Um, pero les quería hablar a ustedes que uh, los que vinieron a platicar y que ya son parte de cooperativas que por favor esto el éxito de esto depende de que ustedes hablen con sus compañeros y compañeras porque no va a valer de nada esto si no llegamos esta palabra al, al, al pueblo ¿no? y a la gente que lo está haciendo entonces uh, lo que ustedes hacen acerca de comunicarlo uh, esto a todos 
um, es lo más importante porque no va a valer nada que adoptemos algo así y que nadie venga y pida el apoyo. Entonces, eso es lo que estamos haciendo. Entonces, depende mucho del esfuerzo que hacemos ahí con todos los compañeros y los vecinos. Sí, gracias. Thank you. And so with that, I believe we have a motion and a second. Uh, those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries. With that, now let's go on to, uh, would it be 65A? Uh, 65A, what would we want to do, a brief uh, presentation? If, if we, brief. we could, and, and if I could do a, a brief introduction. Go ahead. We have four reports before you this evening dealing with the uh, Santa Ana Jail. Uh, three of them are for action, and one is the update that's, that uh, we're going to start with at 65A, an update on the reuse study. Uh, but I'd like to speak to all of them because together they tell a story of what we're trying to do and a recommendation on how we see moving forward uh, from a staff perspective and to get the council's perspective. Um, the, the three action items are to... Um, look at a two-year expansion of the Marshall's con U.S. Marshall's contract so that we'd bring in uh, around 171 additional um, inmates. This is really a temporary uh, contract. It is while they're doing construction in their facility, and it is not a long-term fix for the jail. Uh, but it is, does give us some breathing room while we move forward with the reuse study that you're going to hear uh, this, this evening. We also would like to do some plumbing work in the jail, and you'll hear in the reuse study it is the one area that is particularly weak in the, phys the physical analysis, the physical assessment that they have done. And we need a van in order to operate uh, the jail, even our own holding facility. Um, the reuse study can slow down, it can be more thoughtful, uh, and we can decide in two years uh, what it works, how it works into Santa Ana's economy and what reuses we would like to see there, how much of it, if any, continues to be a jail, or what is a totally new use. Um, in order to do that and do it well, though, we want to make sure that we are really hearing from the council. Uh, what are your ideas? We don't want to get to the end and find out that our ideas we haven't, we haven't thought of and we haven't studied. We haven't looked at whether they would be, contribute to Santa Ana, to the community, and to the revenues the city's looking from for its assets. Um, and we also want to make sure that we are prioritizing the right things in looking at how to analyze the different uses. Uh, is money more important uh, than community benefit? Is the community more important and we'd be willing to operate at a loss? Uh, it, would we want to see a particular kind of use on that, uh, even if it meant that the city would sell the facility or would no longer be the landlord there? Those kind of questions. So we'd like to introduce um, people I think you've probably met before. Uh, from the uh, consulting company so they can tell you where they are midway through the reuse study. Hear ideas this evening if you have them, but please, uh, over the next few weeks, talk to either staff or contact people with the study so we know we have a complete list of things for us to analyze. And then following this, we'll uh, talk to you about whether or not you would like us to proceed with the discussions that we are in for the temporary use with the marshals and then the physical improvements for the facility. Do you want to introduce? And with that, Mayor, unless there are questions of how the staff is looking at this, we will introduce the consultant and move into the reuse study. That's fine. Thank you, Mayor, members of the City Council. I'd like to uh, welcome our consultant team uh, from Vanner Construction Management. Uh, they were retained by the city to assist us with a jail conditions assessment, which is the first part that you've received the executive summary for. And then now they're moving on to the jail reuse options. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Lara Jennings um, from Vanner, and she'll introduce her other two colleagues as well as they go through the item. Uh, following their presentation, we will then open up the public comment portion, and then we'll bring it back to the City Council for discussion. Good evening. We're happy to be here in front of all of you today. 
Um, I am Lara Jennings of Banner Construction Management, as Jorge yes, told you. This is Jim Avoidis, one of my colleagues, and this is Fred Campbell. Uh, these are really my experts. Just, just real quick, if I may, I'm going to recuse myself because I know Veneer, the lady who I believe is uh, very, uh, you know, owns the company, and and so is uh, just as an abundance of caution, I'm not going to participate. And uh, Councilman Solorio is outside the room, so we're going to have to wait until. This is only a receipt and file, right? Report. Still, and. You still need a form? Jose's right out here. No. Oh. Is he an attorney? Yeah, he's right there. Right behind you. The mayor can cruise inside. Are you going to be available? Just speak up. Are we ready? Go to the restroom, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> I like, just been way Oh, my God. Can't I can't see. Do you want to get regular for 10? Or? <laughs> we can't have you leaving because we won't I understand. Warm. I just got, oh, my goodness. Can you guys give me, like, one minute? Because I, I cannot. I can't hold it anymore. Please, <laughs> <laughs> one minute. <laughs> you tried, Gracious. BMI. <laughs> He knows the owner. But do you like The mayor's only recused himself from the reuse discussion. Not yeah. the okay, great. You can begin. Thank you. All right. So good evening, I'm Lara Jennings of Vanner Construction Management. This is Jim Avoidis and this is Fred Campbell. Um, colleagues of mine that are really experts in facilities assessments. Uh, we're here today to give you a status of where we are in terms of the reuse study, explain the findings that we have on the facility, walk you through some evaluation tools we put together, and get some input on options and priorities. I really would like to say a quick thank you to uh, the city and the police department. They've really been supportive in getting us data on operations and really getting us access to the facility so we could really understand the nuances of the Santa Ana jail. There we go. So a status to date, uh, first we have done a jail tour and a kickoff. We reviewed the current issues and objectives. Then we moved into and collected the data and analyzed the data on population, staffing, and operations. We have already reviewed the physical jail spaces and gone through to see what the flow and the operations are there. Today we're here before you to do a workshop to figure out the priorities and the options. Next we'll be identifying and analyzing these options and then finally we'll be creating a formal report for you. With that quick update on status, I'm going to move it along to Jim who's going to talk to you about some of the findings he has to date. Uh we uh, turned in a, um, a couple of reports. One was a comprehensive uh, uh, condition assessment of the entire facility. It's about an 85-page report. And also you have an um, uh, executive summary of that report. And in that report, if you on page 13, is basically our conclusions of the, of the facility, of the jail, for uh, uh, continued use or reuse. And what we did here is we looked at your facility and uh, we did an analysis of each one of the function use areas uh, and rated them. And this is our rating scale, zero to three. Uh, extremely inadequate would be a zero point, and then extremely adequate would be a um, three point. And we created this chart, and this chart is in the report as well. This goes across 14 different function use areas. And these 14 functional use areas, as you can see, is on the bottom here, would include the administration space, the lobby, the visiting space, uh, central control, and so on through the facility, including housing, kitchen, uh, the laundry. We evaluated that each one of those spaces, 1 through 14, through the uh, evaluated the space and the systems, HVAC, the plumbing, electrical, noise control, fire safety, uh, ADA handicap structures and security and as you look see on this chart uh, uh, the under plumbing 1.5 is pretty much deficient right across the board in every one of those spaces uh, that had uh, uh, plumbing and I think that's one of the action items today for you to respond to 
uh, overall, uh, you know, have some deficiencies in space. And as a, a parallel to space, the, your facility comes in about 300 square, 350 square feet per inmate. The rule of thumb is about 400 square feet per inmate for this vintage of jail. It's a 20-year-old facility uh, built in 1997. And today, if we were to build a jail currently being designed, and we have a number of them being designed now, they're running around 500 square feet uh, per inmate. And the reason is, is because uh, custody has changed. Uh, there's many laws. Um, inmates are staying longer uh, in the jail. In addition to that, we're offering more programs, classroom space, more mental health um, uh, response and medical response, and also ADA uh, adds to those spaces. So in comparison to where you're at at 350 to today's standards, you're a little on a deficient site. How you maintain that is by reducing the population and you'd have more space and repurposing some of those spaces for other uses. Um, the, uh, w one of the things that we found about this facility is that uh, I've been to over 100 facilities uh, across the nation and, and almost every one in California. And uh, you have an exemplary facility here, uh, designed uh, very well at the time. As a matter of fact, this is a, a facility that most jail uh, um, administrators would love to operate. It's, it responds well to inmates. It's more normal. Uh, you have carpeting and uh, porcelain fixtures, wood doors, and those are the things that you find at home rather than real, really hardened uh, space where it's a steel door and it slams shut. And it's, and it's noisy. Uh, this is a great jail. If I had to spend some time, this is where I'd spend it. <laughs> so what we've done here is um, we're looking at some detention, if continued detention options. And these are uh, options that were brought to us. Uh, look at it as a temporary holding. And we've already done that piece. Uh, a type 2 facility, and that is just how you're operating it uh, if you move forward with the um, federal marshal's contract. A type two without city personnel. In other words, leasing it out to somebody to take the facility over and operate it. The CDCR transitional reentry that would be operated by CDCR uh, com completely. Also looking at other, you have a tunnel that goes to Orange County, maybe Orange County would want to lease the facility or use portion of it. And of course the Federal Bureau of Prisons. These are all criminal justice detention op operations and there are other ones. Uh, these are out of the box, uh, and these were brought to us as well. Maybe we could use it as a mental health facility. Uh, how about a data center? Uh, police evidence and storage. Uh, certainly there's a lot of secure space where you can lock up a lot of storage. Uh, homeless shelter, youth hostel, and hotel. These were all options that were brought to us. We, are, we want to focus in on these options so that we can study each one of these and adequately bring back a report to uh, the city council here. Next slide. Okay, Fred, you want to do this one? Sure. The important point here is that uh, we are now at the point in this uh, study uh, we're at the last critical analytical task, and that really involves identifying and uh, uh, comprehensively evaluating uh, the four priority uh, jail use options that the city. Uh, is interested in receiving the evaluation our recommendations on and we need additional uh, input we need to make sure uh, over the next uh, week or two that we have identified uh, all of the potential options and ideas uh, from the uh, City Council uh, yourself we also need to make sure we understand uh, 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 the uh, options that would come from the uh, public input tonight uh, and with that, uh, we will be able to uh, move forward. Now, we prepared for you a handout that I think you received today that uh, uh, lays out uh, uh, several items. First, it shows you what Jim just uh, uh, reviewed is the uh, various uh, uh, jailed uh, detention 
options that have been identified today. Uh, also, those other potential uh, jail reuse options, the out-of-box op options that uh, uh, we have identified. The handout also lays out the uh, uh, assessment criteria that you see on this slide that we will be applying uh, in the uh, our evaluation uh, of the uh, uh, four priority options. In that handout also, you'll see that uh, we're asking the City Council to provide uh, your priority rating so that uh, with, within this criteria, uh, if, uh, uh, depending on what the analysis shows, uh, we have a way of bringing in uh, your uh, rated priority uh, criteria and concerns in the entire evaluation process. And in total, I think uh, as we move forward, if we can get that information, uh, we'll have a document that clearly I think will meet your long-term uh, uh, needs in terms of assessing uh, the, the reuse potential and, and options for your, your facility uh, 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 as part of this project. That's all we have. Oh, fantastic. Thank you very much. So um, I know we have some public comment before we bring it to the City Council. So let us see, hear from the uh, public. Uh, first, we have uh, Madeline Spencer, followed by Robert Tijan, uh and then Robert Herrera. You guys can be ready. Madeline? Good evening again. Um, so the jail, it costs our city over 82 to 100 million dollars which we've been paying off through a bond the, we've been paying off the bond through subsidizing it with our general fund as well as the ice contract that we've had with the federal government um, this has been going on for over 20 years and there was never any revenue brought into the city by this jail. So if we look at the whole entrepreneurial spirit of the jail being brought into our city as a venture, it's a failed venture. Um, I know that there still needs to be, the jail still needs to be paid off and there needs to be some kind of a revenue stream that's brought in through the jail. And one of the things that was mentioned just now was about it still being used as a criminal health detention center and there's been rumors that the county is now going to buy that or use the federal government contract and reuse the jail to do the exact same thing that was being done before i hope that that isn't the way that the jail is going to be reimagined and reused and i hope that some of those other opportunities that the return on investment is really looked at for example for something like a data center and i'm bringing up the data center even though I the idea of a homeless shelter and all these different things that were mentioned are great but from hearing in the business community and also across the city what one of the biggest problems is and also thinking about the way that a data center can serve government the college the high schools and the business community as a whole in this city the fact that we're in a techno we have a technological revolution going on and we're back in 2010 in the city of Santa Ana is a problem so to me I just am saying I hope that you guys in that study are going to be looking at the actual amount of money that can be actually utilized the ways that different folks in different areas of this whole city and the region because the county will most likely use a cloud computing system as well the facility is already steel and um, and concrete which is perfect for that kind of a center and it takes us out of the jail business altogether thank you so, Madeline if you can conclude I don't see mr. Uh, Robert Taijan if I could follow by Robert Herrera and then Jan Maslin and Fabi Hakom and Daisy Ramirez. Hello, Council. I'm here to speak to both items 65A and 65C, the jail reuse study and your consideration to expand and increase jail services to the U.S. Marshal Service by 173 beds. The city of Santana should not sustain a jail business model because there's no clear public safety benefit to having a for-profit jail in Santana. Jail businesses like the ICE contract only justify and are dependent on the criminalization of vulnerable communities like people of color, immigrants, the homeless, people with mental health needs, and the youth. 
We need to continuously move toward an expedited phase out of the punitive jail business model and instill a model that centers prevention and intervention, re-entry services for the formerly incarcerated. Expanding jail services to the U.S. Marshal Service is only acting as a placeholder for the potential of ICE to return to our city jail when the Marshal's contract is over. What you are essentially doing is pursuing this contract to create more unsustainable jobs. The police department already receives more than half of the city's budget. Hiring more police officers in the short term would mean a spike in unaffordable pension plans in the future. The city has already noted that it would have a difficult time paying the pension plans. The city cannot make short-sighted decisions because doing so will push the city much closer to bankruptcy. The city of Santana has an opportunity tonight to intentionally and strategically invest in addressing the needs of Santana residents, the youth, the homeless, those with mental health needs by centering solutions that are proactive, preventative, and cost-effective in the long-term, that are long-term public safety solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto. Jan? Jen, followed by Fabi, Hakom, and Daisy Ramirez. Good evening. My name is Jan Meslin. I'm a Costa Mesa resident and Director of Social Change Development for Civic Community Initiatives for Visiting Immigrants in Confinement. We're a national nonprofit working to abolish the U.S. immigration detention system, which we believe is just one part of the mass incarceration system that's inherently racist system profiting off of the suffering of our communities. And I'm speaking to 65A and C. This city is in the process of a jail reuse study. To make a decision now on how to reuse the jail, even if it's for only a two-year commitment, would be premature. The city should not be making any decisions on the city jail until the full study is complete. We ask that the city council postpone the vote on the U.S. Marshals contract or vote no on signing an expanded contract with the U.S. Marshals for additional bed space. We're also concerned about Vanner's study on the conditions of the jail. The original RFQ that Vanner responded to required the contractor to do a study on the human conditions of the jail such as overall medical care, food quality, solitary confinement practices, and other issues that would help this city determine whether it wanted to continue to be a part of an industry profiting off of those types of living conditions for human beings. We want to encourage the city to add this requirement back into the scope of Vanner's work. Without a full study on the jail conditions, the city cannot make an informed decision. We also want to point out that Vanner has made no attempts beyond this city council meeting to consult with the community about what the community needs or hopes to see for how the current jail facility is used in the future. This is the first time the community has had the opportunity to learn about Vanner's methodology until now. It also is the first time the community is learning that the city has been in very detailed conversations with the U.S. Marshals about expanding the city's contract. This was supposed to be a transparent process. We encourage the city to ensure that Vanner is speaking to the community, and we encourage the city manager's office that is liaising with Vanner to set up more opportunities. Jackie, please wrap up your lights for ready. community meetings. Thank you. Thank you, Fabi Hakom, followed by Daisy Ramirez. Hi. Good night. Uh, my name is Fabi Hakome. I am the program coordinator for Orange County Immigrant Youth United. Um, and I am here to speak on item 65A and 65, 65C. Um, well, first, I want to say thank you to your staff. They have uh, been very helpful, specifically Jorge, um, in providing information um, that we have requested. However, I think that the part that was the most Concerning to me was the 65C item, um, contracting with the U.S. Marshals. As a lot of us know, um, the hot mess that is Santana, um, you know, the, the whole thing of like a lot of y'all won't be here in two years, uh, meaning that if there are city council members like uh, Council Member Solorio and Villegas that are going to be either staying um, or there are going to be more seats that are going to be bought by the Police Officers Association. This is concerning to us because you're kind of just pushing two years. Um, we don't know what's going to happen. A lot of y'all won't be here that have been supportive of ending the ICE contract. 
if council members like them stay, then we don't know if in two years they're going to try to bring ICE back into into the city and into the jail. So let's let's stop. Um, I said it earlier and I forgot, but it's kind of like let's stop putting off like the inevitable, inevitable, um, and just you know use it for something else. A data center sounds really good. Um, come back to the community and actually ask what we need. Uh, I do live here now, although I'm still very proud to be from Silverado. Um, and just just listen to what we have to say, right? It's it's a lot of money. Um, it's a lot of decisions. Um, if you can postpone it, have a meeting with us, um, or have when you actually come out and talk to the community directly. Thank you. Thank you. Followed by Daisy. Good evening. My name is Daisy Ramirez, and I'm the Jails Project Coordinator at the American Civil Liberties Union of Southern California. I am here to speak on items 65A and 65C. The ACLU finds the facility conditions assessment issued by Vanner to be inadequate and troubling. As a construction management company, Vanner is ill-equipped to assess the needs of the community and project, project and or assume future jail populations. In their conditions assessment, Vanner identified deficiencies in the medical, men, medical mental health, and dental space in the jail, among other areas. The findings are based on the jail's rated capacity of 480 individuals and area per space relative to what Vanner deemed 19 comparable medium-sized correctional facilities. The finding assumes that the facility will be at full rated capacity. This is extremely problematic given that as of yesterday, the jail was at 41% occupancy relative to the BSCC's rated capacity and 39% occupancy relative to the facility's maximum capacity. Identifying areas as deficient in space disregards the fact that the city is currently struggling to fill vacant beds. Although troubling, the finding is not surprising. As a construction company, Vanner has an inherent conflict of interest to make such an assessment, an assessment that unfortunately incentivizes the criminalization of Santa Ana residents. The city needs to move away from the jail business model and prioritize the needs of community members. The people of Santa Ana deserve a council that puts them first a council that invests in opportunities for them to thrive rather than a council that condones the incarceration of folks to pay off debts resulting from poor decisions and failed projections. We urge you, you, we urge you to use this opportunity to invest in the people you were elected to represent. Thank you for your time. Thank you. So at this, um, at this time, I'm going to bring it back to uh, the dais and um, open it up for comment uh, with my colleagues. Um, anyone wish to start? No comments. Okay, I got it. Oh, wow! So, so we're uh, 65A, correct? Correct. We're going this is one on at a time, right? Yes. Okay. Thank you, uh, Madam. Uh, I broke Tim Martinez. Excuse me. So, uh, yeah, I believe that we should uh, continue with the uh, reuse study to see what's going on. Uh, wait till it's complete. There's nothing wrong with being thorough, but at the same time, you know, we, we need to. Um, somebody needs to pay for that jail. Someone has to pay the bill because we're all paying for it. Everyone here in the city is paying for it. And, um, you know, we cannot afford any more self-inflicted, uh, you know, uh, action. So I'm for the, uh, I'm open to the, uh, see what else uh, the, the study brings. There's a lot of good things on here, but in the meantime, we need we need uh, we need to pay for the for the building. It's just there. I mean, this thing was here a long time ago, 20 years ago, and there was. And we already spoke about the different uh, the reason why the jail was built. It was a different time. The Orange County Jail didn't have all the facilities it has now. Santa Ana was kind of forced to have their own facility. And then the jail expansion took place at the county. And then the city of Santa Ana was uh, stuck with their own building. So they had to get creative and see how they were going to pay for that. So, you know, it's really tough being in this position because someone needs to be responsible for the city. Someone has to take care of this. And so in the meantime, while we're waiting for other options, for other ideas, we should uh, move forward with uh, some of the recommended actions that are on here. But... Yes, I'm for the uh, continue the study and see uh, what comes of it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. 
Any more comments? Councilman Sarmiento. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, and I want to thank staff for working with us. I know, um, I forget when we gave the direction for the repurpose study to be done. Do we know? Okay. So it's been a while, right, um, that, um, that we requested this. And, um, you know, I'm looking at the status report and the scope of work, and it looks like um, three of the first tasks, three of the six tasks um, are completed at 100%. But what I heard is some tours were done, you know, some, some assessments were done. But that's, a, you know, that's not a lot to do in, in, in you know, over a year, so I'm a little disappointed on the timing. I'm also disappointed that we don't have anything that reflects, as somebody mentioned, uh, from the RFQ or the RFP that was circulated, you know, having to do with the community outreach. I wish I would have seen a line item there and for there to have been good, robust discussions and um, and opportunities for our residents and our stakeholders to also comment and opine as to what they see would be um, a long-term, you know, possibility for that facility. Um, you know, the the I think one of the uh, items on the RFP was also uh, to talk about the jail conditions, right? You know, what the conditions of the inmates were because there was a lot of discussion on treatment, uh, medical attention, and so. You know, I hope that there, with additional time, uh, those things could be assessed, those things could be brought to our attention, but I'd hate to wait another year for it. So um, I really, really am a little um, disappointed with the um, update. I wish we would have had, a, you know, some more information, um, some more detail, and again, more from what you heard from our community. Um, you know, I, I do think that there are some items here that are listed out of the box reuse studies or reuse purposes that um, you know may make sense may be feasible feasible and may be reasonable but I guess what we want to hear and I guess what I want to hear is what are the parameters looking at that facility what could that be what could it be over time and that's a long-term question we have a short-term problem and those long-term solutions aren't going to solve the short-term problem that we have but um, Again, I hope that staff can work with our um, with the firm that we've retained. Again, I don't think we're moving at the right pace. I don't think that the results that they provided today are satisfactory, and I hope that there's some um, some improvement because it really is underwhelming to see this and disappointing. Madam City Manager, I just wanted to clarify that it was um, we contracted with them in April, so it's been three months. I do agree that it's the easy part of the study that has been done because it's looking at what we have and the difficult pieces are moving forward on what should it be. Uh, it, should we be able to move forward with some of the other items tonight? Uh, I think you would see a much more robust study and be much more satisfied with the results when they come back because the schedule was very tight and it had to be because you had to adopt a budget with a huge deficit in it and uh, we couldn't have all the time in the world to figure out how we were going to accommodate part of that was the, the money that we were losing from the jail. Uh, but uh, we hear you clearly on the community outreach and we'll make sure that uh, we are, uh, we add more outreach into our proposal going forward before we bring something back regardless of what you decide on the study going forward. And if we can't adjust their scope of work because we already have a defined scope of work for them, maybe just you know have our staff we can do that at augmenting Absolutely. information so they can incorporate that into their uh, findings great thank you councilman Sarmiento councilman Solorio yes uh, thank you uh, really uh, agreeing with which of much of what uh, uh, councilmember Sarmiento has mentioned uh, I do want to see additional outreach and a variety of outreach uh, obviously we know that some groups have been more involved with this than others but uh, you know, our, our Comlink uh, board, uh, some of the neighborhood associations may have interest, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, we have our two downtown uh, business associations, we have um, some, uh, you know, like our, our community watchdog uh, programs uh, that are public safety focused and oriented. Um, <coughs> You know, and others. You know, maybe maybe just some some general event. Uh, in in terms of the work to date, uh, 
I know when I saw the city was beginning to work at, on this, I did see that the scope was pretty limited, but I think it was with the idea that they had wanted to get information to the council quickly so that decisions could be made. Um, I, I do appreciate, though, that before they went too far ahead in terms of making conclusions about reuse that you came to check in with the council formally and then also open it up to the community for, for input. So, so that was uh, really good. The, 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 the way I, I see it is that, you know, in, in the short term, we're stuck with it as a jail, whether it's, you know, empty or full or halfway full. I mean, uh, it is what it is, and it's going to take some costs, uh, a lot of expenditures to remake it into anything else. Uh, and so as Councilmember Sarmiento was saying, just in terms of the parameters going forward, you know, it's things like, you know, what are these other reuse opportunities? What are they going to cost? How long would it take to permit them? What would the environmental process look like? All those things take uh, time and money. And as we look at it really over the next 10 years of this, uh, you know, we need to know about that. And I think the out-of-the-box ideas are the ones that I most commonly hear. So I think they're a good start. I think when the report is done, we may like the outcomes, we may not. We should continue to do outreach if needed. Um, in terms of the, the short-term uh, uses, which really are the criminal justice detention uses, I do want to have a lot of focus on working with CDCR and maybe having them bring some reentry folks. I think that's something progressive and positive that we can do. You know, there's, uh, you know, most inmates, they leave with a few dollars, very little training, very little idea of where they're going to live, what they're going to do, where they're going to receive services. And there's other counties where they have reentry facilities where the last six months or the year they go to their community, they reorient, them, they reorient themselves to their families, uh, they find places to live, they get IDs, they figure out what services that they can get, where they might live and work, et cetera. And I think that would be a very positive thing for our community as a, a public safety uh, benefit for them and the community as a whole. So I'm particularly excited about that. I don't know that the whole jail needs to be that, but you know we have uh, you know a lot of beds and, 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 and modules and floors there that at least partially we can do that. And then some of the current federal and other contracts that we have Maybe we keep them. And I think we also need to know for the contracts that are there, what are the timelines for them? Uh, how much do they pay? What are the restrictions? So we also need to know about the existing uh, contracts as well. And um, I know uh, you know the red light is, is, is on, so I will stop there. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Councilman Solorio. And again, this is just a, a receive and fi uh, a file, correct? And so I would just make my point and... Um, I think I, I, I've been consistent from day one. My, my position has not changed, and it will not change. Um, and so I just want to make that very clear to the public, is that we need to get out of the business. Um, it is not to, um, sustainable to, to, to um, really run a jail on contracts that you know have a, a a life cycle on them and we're dependent on the federal government or state government that at any given time they can say you know hey we don't want to do business with you and we make these investments that's not a sustainable thing that our city should continue to be in knowing the position that we're currently in now and so we need to take that into consideration and um and when i make decisions i'm looking at the totality of of, of the city and its sustainability not just now but 20 years from now the decisions that were made 20 years ago, you know, the, the chickens have come home to roost. Not only that, then when you look at the capacity of this jail, we're not even in compliance with ADA. We, 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 you know, we could get fined. We're not in compliance. And, and we're at capacity. So I just want to state that to our city attorney and our city manager that this report is indicating that we're not in compliance with ADA. And so for us, you know, when we, we look at educational opportunities or whatever, the report is, is stating here that it's not adequate, that the space is not adequate. And so um, I, I get that and I appreciate um, um, they providing this condition assessment because it really 
helps me understand what can we actually do there. Um, but also as well that, you know, the space that we have is also inadequate and we're in, 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 in not in compliance with ADA, which means that, you know, we've been running uh, at full capacity at times at 350 square feet when it should be 400. And so kind of inhumane conditions in many respects, um, you know, so I, I want to make that clear as well, whether they're inmates or not, you know, the, you know, the standard is 400 and I understand that this jail is 20 years old, but maybe we shouldn't be at that capacity knowing that we have to be in compliance, knowing that that's what the standards are. So why did we get to that level, right? Because we needed to generate money uh, to help pay for these services. But in the re uh, when we look at this in totality, the reality is that when the city's not in the business to make a dollar, it's, it's in the business to recover its cost. So let's that make that very clear. Cities are not in the business to make money. That's not our role. It's customer service. Yes, we do provide services if it pertains to planning and other stuff like that, but we have these fee schedules, right? It's to recover cost. And so we have to look at what we're doing here and where do we see this five, 10 years from now and poss the possibility is 16 months from now, I'm not going to be on this dais. And I think it's important for us to understand that the sustainability, financial sustainability of this city is vital towards it for its future. And the decisions that we make today have huge implications two, three, five, ten years from now, that we're dealing with decisions that were made 20 years ago. The chickens will come home to roost. And we're now dealing with the decisions that were made 20 years ago here today. So I want you all to know that any decisions that we make here today when we talk about our preferred future that we don't know what our, what our future holds, yes we do in government. Because it's the policies that we make will dictate what our future is going to be two, three, five, ten years down the road. So let's understand that, and you know, I, and I'll leave it at that. But I would just hope that, and I and I want to bring to our attention that you know um, that I hope this council does take in consideration some of the uh, options that are out here, and that we go back to Veneer and provide them, you know, the survey that they're asking of uh, what this council in regards to this priority ranking. I will do that first thing tomorrow because I believe it's important to give you that feedback so that you understand uh, where we're at. But for me, um, what's important for me is, again, the sustainability of, it, of, of, of the city is very important for me. And looking at out-of-the-box reuse options, I, I really believe the data center, and I know you mentioned in your report about some, some technical issues. We have plumbing issues in here. We have to spend $150,000, right? So there's, there's deficiencies within plumbing. There's some deficiencies within technology um, a, as well. But look, we are in a di digital revolution. It is here to stay. We had the industrial revolution. We're now in the digital revolution. And guess what? This city is far behind when it comes to technology. And we have not really come up to the 21st century. We have an opportunity to look at this jail, at, at, at creating a data center that not will only help city government, county government, school governments, but also the small businesses that are here and, and, and utilize that facility, which doesn't need a lot of technology to store data. Um, it has the, the, the current infrastructure. We may need to make some changes, but I'm not in the construction field. I'm not a practitioner within the technological field, but I really believe that is an option that we should definitely consider because I think it would be uh, the, 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 the least impact in regards to the city um, having to um, retrofit that specific building. And so those are just my comments. I will ask our mayor, again, this is a receiving file, ask our mayor to come back so that we can move forward with 65B and on. Mr. Mayor? Over, so I said, I'm going to go over. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
All right, um, Madam Clerk, where are we? Is it? Um, 65B. All right. I would entertain a motion on item 65B. So moved. Move. Is there a, there was a motion and a second? Those in I'll favor, second. please say aye. Mr. Mayor, could yes. I have comment just very quickly? What we're doing here and, and um, is really replacing pipes that have to be replaced. And, and so I just want to just state that for the record um, in our facility. They're inadequate, even according to this report here. It definitely needs to get done. And so I'm supportive of that. And just but want to say for the record that, you know, we need to do this because assist the, the current piping system is definitely inadequate. Thank you. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries. Item 65C, approved terms and conditions for proposed additional bed space with U.S. Marshals. I'd entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Any comment? Those in favor, please say aye. 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 No. One no. Motion carries. Let's go on item 65D. Uh, this is the authorization purchase of a prisoner transport van. Uh, it's $46,000 plus a $1,000 contingency. Is there a motion? So move. I'll second. Those in Mr. favor? Mr. Mayor, I have Go comment ahead. on this. Um, um, Madam City uh, Manager, on this here, you're asking for a one-time purchase per, uh, uh, payment of a, a van to transport um, inmates, um, can I just ask? This is um, for current the the current um, inmates we have, or is this um, in was in contingent towards the Marshall um, contract? Contract. It's for the current inmates that we have. We need this this van regardless of any vote on the uh, additional beds that we were. Okay, just wanted to state that for the record. Thank All you. right, I'd entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Is second. there a second? Second. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 aye those opposed, motion carries. Uh, 65E, this is support the California State Senate Bill 4 regarding the Cal Optima board composition. I'd entertain a motion. So moved with comment. Second. All right, go ahead and comment, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to get an update from um, Jorge, if you can. I know you gave us, uh, or we received an update from one of our lobbyists regarding what the status of the, um, of the Senate bill is, but more importantly, what the effort to reconfigure the Cal Optimal Board. And coincidentally, we had some of the Cal Optimal staff here today. We realize that so many of our residents are recipients. Um, of, of the aid that, um, and services that Cal Optima offers. Um, what's the status of the, uh, the board's effort to reconfigure, sure. re reconfigure some of the seats? Thank you, Council Member, Mayor, members of the City Council. Um, subsequent to the Legislative Council Committee, the Board of Supervisors took the item up for consideration once again. Um, and the original move was to add all of the members of the uh, supervisorial board onto the Cal Optima board. They have since changed that position and are leaving it as is and will re uh, um, look at this matter in January. Um, so at this point, the uh, board of supervisors at the county level is not making any recommended changes. Um, the bill is, is, my understanding, still moving forward. Um, as you mentioned, the city of Santa Ana does have a large amount of, res of uh, recipients of the Cal Optima benefits um, between the city uh, of Santa Ana and the overall um, amount of people that are served, over 800,000 people. The city serves quite a number of those folks, as well as represents a, a large majority of the Latino recipients uh, in the program. Uh, across Cal Optima, the total proportion of Latinos that receive benefits are about 53%. Uh, Santa Ana does comprise a, a large majority of that. But we do also have Vietnamese uh, residents as well as other uh, ethnicities that participate in Cal Optima. So what I would suggest is that we continue to support and we support the uh, Senate bill that's uh, proposed by Senator Mendoza because, again, we don't know if the efforts will continue to try to reconfigure or whether they won't. And um, just make sure, it, as you know, out of an abundance of caution, um, we uh, want to make sure that the board provides services to its to our residents and to its recipients. Um, so just to make sure that um, the board uh, remains in the configuration that it's in with the seats that exist. So I'll move the item. 
I second all those in favor, please indicate by the comment. Yes, Councilman Sobor. Uh, yeah, I want to thank uh, Councilmember Sarmiento for bringing this forward. Uh, as was discussed earlier, health care is a big deal in the country and in our community, and so many of our residents uh, use CalOptima. You know, we found from city stats it's 43% of our residents are in CalOptima, so we ought to care about it. Uh, I think the status quo is better than what some of the supervisors were recommending, um, but I'd even like the staff and our legislative advocate to consider saying maybe there ought to be somebody from Latino background on there or large cities that have heavy concentration of Caloptima uh, customers uh, so that we're ad adequately represented because uh, the status quo, yeah. frankly, doesn't represent us well enough, and this may be an opportunity to uh, fix this condition for our uh, our residents. Thank you. So we have a motion and a second. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries unanimously. 75A, this is a public hearing to consider adopting a resolution establishing and amending San Jose Municipal Code Chapter 39 Water and Sewer Fees for Fiscal Year 2017-18. Uh, Madam Clerk, do we have any written communication? I have not received any. I do have a speaker card from Elias Siegley, but I believe he left the meeting. Uh, well, I'm going to open up the public hearing regardless and ask, is there anybody that wishes to address us on this item? Seeing no one, I will close the public hearing and bring it to Council for and consideration. Mayor, may, may I just make one um, statement? Sure. I'd like to make sure um, that we clarify in our on our agenda and our minutes that this resolution is establishing water and sewer fees, but it is not amending the Santa Ana Municipal Code as suggested in the title. We Got can only it. amend the code by ordinance, and that may have created some confusion and some calls that we received today, and I just noticed mm -hmm. that this evening. So I'd like to amend that to take out that language, please. Can you please take that out, Madam Clerk? Okay, so done. So with that, I will close the public hearing and bring it back to Council for consideration. Do we need to amend the motion then to reflect the uh, new I, wording? I, we can, but I think, the Clerk, can you just read the motion the way you're going to record it, please? The motion will be to adopt the resolution that's being proposed. So on the, we're just going to delete the, the language the that, the it, that says an amending Santa Ana Municipal Code. We're just going to delete that from the title and all of our minutes. And so it's just a public hearing to consider adopting a resolution establishing water, water and sewer fees for fiscal year 2017-18 period. So I'll move it with that um, change in the title. All right. Can we have a second and we have a comment no, I don't not a second I just want to have comment uh, I, I have Council B yes so second go yeah, ahead I have comment on on this and so uh, this is establishing just um, sewer and water fees but when do these go into effect thirty thirty days, days. okay um, my second question um, is that I would say maybe three, four years ago, the city went into, uh, uh, did a bond it, we, we, uh, in regards to water and, and, and uh, to a sewer, um, or we did a study, I, 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 uh, one or the two, three or four years ago. And was that part of the goals and objectives based on that study was to, to move us in this direction? Um, so why are we, I, I guess the question for me is, uh, why are we in, um, you know, why are we moving forward with these water and sewer uh, fees and that will take effect in 30 days? <coughs> Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem and uh, members of council. Mayor, um, are you referring to rate adjustment that went in effect three years ago? Mm -hmm. uh, that is separate at this one, and I have uh, Nabil explain what this is. Okay. This is the routine increases, uh, kind of a, a yearly increase that needs to happen okay. get approved by council. Yes, Th these fees are administrative fees such as application or permit fees to conduct water related business. Uh, for, for example, if someone is putting a meter, they need to p pay a fee for that meter, application fee, and the cost of installation of meter. Those are the kind of fees so that... So what we're doing here is just recovering our costs. Yes. So I, and that's what I just, I'm wanting to I I explain because three years ago, because I got calls today 
that you know you we did a rate adjustment three years ago and are we you're doing this again to us so this is two different things as Fred indicated we did that, that three years ago and this here is just moving forward with the fees to recover our costs that's correct when they do a permitting that thank you very much sure. all right thank you for that clarification any more comment yeah just another clarification thing um, and I'm reading the staff report again from what I've heard it's still unclear to me though whether this this is just restating the fees that we currently charge or whether there are any increases being proposed um, most of the fees that are listed here are already in effect and that the the amount has not changed there is few that have been added by the addition or the amendment of chapter 39 a handful that we added such as fire hydrant test fee and witness test fees so those those were things that we didn't charge for before that's correct okay so it's a restatement of the existing fees and for items that we weren't previously charging fees for that's correct. now to recover fees for those things exactly um, we are doing that to recover uh, that's cost recovery fees uh, and is there a schedule for when the regular water fees would increase again, or that's subject to the to the fee study that is is being conducted? These fees, or the water rates? Future fee increases from these. These fees are adjusted on an annual basis. So these may get readjusted again for the following fiscal year. That's correct through the budget process. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Just to just to make a clarification, the the rate increases was mainly original three years ago, was an inf infrastructure improvement, right. mm -hmm. you know, pipe replacements, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. pump replacements, things like that nature, mm -hmm. and we said we're going to come back to council after five years, actually three years, and see whether the fees are. Uh, appropriate we can mm -hmm. increase the fee or, or mm -hmm. even reduce the fees mm -hmm. we we haven't seen the, seen the reason right now to come to council for increase okay. yet maybe in, in so this one is or two just years, a restatement okay. maybe one or two years we reevaluate the whole process again we come back to the council and we'll say maybe we should increase or decrease the general fees that's that's where we are okay all right so we have a motion to second those in favor please say aye aye aye, aye those opposed motion carries Madam City Clerk, are we now on the Housing Authority Housing Authority meeting? Okay, I'm going to convene the Housing Authority meeting, and I would entertain a motion on the consent counter items one and two. So moved. Second. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed. Motion carries. Item number three. That's a Yardy contract amendment. Item number three. The business counter. I entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries. And now we're to public comments for the council. I'm going to turn things over to Mayor Pro Tem Martinez. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Have a great evening. Thank you. Um, Alan Wu, looks like Alan has left. Brooke Weitzman, followed by Lizzie M. Lyles. Good evening, council members. My name is Brooke Weitzman. I'm an attorney at the Elder Law and Disability Rights Center. I last spoke to you back in September, as I've discussed with you before, and you know criminalization of homelessness is an ineffective, expensive, and unconstitutional option in terms of how to deal with the problem of housing. In September, many of us came and spoke to you when you discussed the resolution. The ACLU pointed out that the resolution was mute, moot except for the goal of increasing surveillance and increasing enforcement and that those things cause trauma. We know that those actions contradict the U.S. Interagency's Council on Homelessness, the county's 10-year plan and the city's plan, which all promote decriminalization in a housing first model. At the same time, OCO told you that the religious communities found the use of threats to herd people into areas that have since become refugee-like camps were wrong and harmful and asked you to look for solutions. I asked you to reconsider and reminded you that your statements from just a few years before supported that there were basic human rights and dignity and that you were looking for solutions for housing and storage. Yet, as many of us feared since that resolution passed in September, the actions by the city have been systematic efforts to cause more problems for homeless people and to increase the criminalization. The city has slowly relocated residents 
using threats of citation and arrest. As people have been pushed out of the areas with shade and grass, fences have been erected to ensure they can't return. More threats and citation and arrest have pushed the people into the courtyard terminal, regardless of whether the terminal was over capacity or affected the mental health of those people. The people who were not moved into the courtyard were forced into the Plaza of the Flags, where they now live in an area that's only cement outside of any of the grass and shade that could protect them from the elements, under this constant scrutiny from the overhead cameras and from the increased police enforcement. Over the past month, law enforcement has increased the issuance of citation, expanded the no-notice seizure and destruction of property, demanded that people take down the umbrellas even on the hottest days. I've watched workers throw away personal items by tossing them over the fence into trucks. Because this not only violates the Constitution and also creates a public health crisis, endangering our most vulnerable community members. Brooke, can you conclude your comments? Thank certainly. You. We had no choice but to file a lawsuit seeking an injunction to end these actions. We've requested that the city cease enforcement of the Municipal Code 10551 immediately, discontinue the seizures until there's adequate protocol to give pre and post deprivation notice and store in a meaningful way for recovery, to stop actions that enforce homeless, enforce homeless individuals with medical conditions into direct sunlight. We look forward to working with the city to find real solutions to these problems and to making sure that everyone can live with dignity knowing their constitutional rights will not be violated. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you. Uh, Lizzie? Yes. Followed by Carlos Aguilar and Barbara Lamar. My name is Lizzie Lyles and I am a member of Central City Association and I'm here to talk about fireworks in Santa Ana, safety and possibly banning on the 4th of July of this year, in my neighborhood, I couldn't leave my house because of the problems of fireworks, the noise, the smoke, all of, all of the, the trimmings of fireworks. It was like World War III in my area. Uh, the fireworks began possibly about a month before and they're still continuing right now. And I am concerned about that in, in Santa Ana and I think we need to start a conversation. I know I've heard that there has been conversations prior to, but I think we need to seriously do that. Uh, the day after the 4th, I walked the city of Santa Ana and you all need to pay me for picking up bottles and cans for doing that. But <laughs> I walk the city and the city streets are debris, trash, really a mess. And we need to do something about it. And that's why I'm here tonight. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for coming. And they're out, still Lyles. popping those fireworks. It's irritating. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Miss Lyles. Thank you. Thank you for coming out. Yeah. Thank you. Next is Carlos Aguilar. Oh, yes. Carlos Aguilar. Is Carlos here? If not, followed by Barbara Lamar. And then followed by Gilbert. Good evening. I'm Barbara Lamir. Lamir. I'm a 52-year resident. And I'm concerned about our Centennial Regional Park. It opened on, here's one of my children's little paper, um, May 31st through June 1st, 1980, 37 years ago. And we're still with Rancho San Diego. I'm not against education. That is our park space. They're talking about 2.6 acres. That's only the part the building's not on. Not all the parking they're taking up all over the park. Their buildings are falling apart. They're temporary. They have sewer problems. They have water problems. They had that five years ago, and they're still holding off. We need to really think about it. We have that land conversion come up. If you don't understand what it is, we have people in Parks and Rec and write it out and tell you the whole story, what's going on here. I truly, as a resident right up the street, don't totally understand why we even did this. Gave them a 30 years and then added on and added on. 
That's our land, the people of the city's land. And talk about losing money. We were getting 125000 a year, clear back in 2002, from the county to maintain the park. I have a record of in, in 2012, the college paid us approximately $27,000 for the use of that land for maintenance. 7%. What are they paying now? What have they been paying? Who knows? Who gives free away? How are they going to get what they've invested, they say? You're supposed to be on a lease. You make improvements on a lease, you don't get anything back. Please look at it. It's coming up next month. We're going to submit it. And then after that, see what the, the Park Service says. Hopefully they're looking out for us. But we as a city should have. 37 years later, their lease isn't up till November of 2019. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Barbara. Gilbert Zamar, Jr., followed by Madeline Spencer and Alex Latz. Good evening, City Council. Well, since he left, Mayor Polito, since you're not here, and Mayor Pro Tem Martinez. <clears throat> On behalf of myself, I'm a parishioner at St. Joseph and also a fellow knight. I think uh, we walked with you, the cities, the last time you were there. Still going to uh, want to follow up, follow up with you guys regarding the uh, liability situation that we have, possibly still regarding the crossing guard. That's crossing the, the fellow parishioners and city members of the area. Um, we've been noticing there's been a, there's still been a lot of uh, traffic that's going around still through masses and stuff like that. Even though the presence of the police officers that's been there, it's been very helpful. They went out, they gave out the uh, they were with the motorcycle, you know, community outreach, which was great. There was a lot of good response from the from the fellow parishioners, and actually the uh, Father Efren um, gave a good response to it. He really liked it and uh, really pushed a lot of it. And he's been actually making a good notice as far as doing masses during the, during the uh, you know, towards the end of the beginning announcements and stuff like that. He also submitted a letter which I gave to uh, the clerk this evening. Um, this is on behalf of uh, Father Efren Flores. It says, Mayor Miguel Pulido, San and City of Santa Ana City Council. Regarding request of traffic light at the crossing of Lacey Street and Civic Center Drive. Dear Mayor, Miguel, Dear Mayor Miguel Pulido and members of the City Council, let me introduce myself. My name is Father Efren Flores, pastor of St. Joseph Church. I hope and pray that this letter finds you and your family well. I take this opportunity to express my gratitude for all, of, for all that you do for our city. Thank you for the Council for all that you do. On June 17, 2017 at 5 p.m., <clears throat> excuse me, after the 5 p.m. mass around 6.19 p.m., at the intersection of Lacey and Civic Center Drive, we had an incident that ended in tragedy. A member of, of our community, Ms. Charlene Hansen, as you guys are well aware of, was hit by a car and later she died that evening. Mayor Miguel Polito and members of the City Council, I come with you at, to a request to request a light at the crosswalk of Lacey and Civic Center Drive. This traffic light will help to protect and save the lives of our children, seniors, parishioners and members of our community. This crosswalk is very busy and is used by children from two different schools as well as the church and community members. In the past we've had accidents at this intersection and fortunately did not result in these infatalities. Ms. Charlene Hansen was a very, well active, very active member in our community. We made, this, we made this request because we do not want to lose any, any more life. I know the city city has many needs. I see this I see this one request for a traffic light as high priority. Please consider supporting us in this urgent need for our community from Bush until the to, from Bush until the end of Civic Center. We have only two stops, which causes many cars to speed by the school and church. I look forward to your response to your request. Also, I look forward to the opportunity meeting with you in the future. Yours in Christ, Father Efren Flores. Thank you, Mr. Zamar. Do I know the red light's on? If you just give me one more second. She was very, very helpful in the community. A very kind lady, as you always have known. 
And um, I think my fellow knight down here, Dan, mentioned last time he was here. We have never seen, I, I, was, I didn't have the opportunity to be there for a funeral. But from what I heard, what the funeral consisted of is, is it's just insane. I mean, it's just, it was beautiful. The, outreach, the, the many lives that she touched, I mean, it's unheard of. You know, talk about uh, service to your community. She was a service to the community. I mean, we can't have people like that just because of carelessness, people that are actually driving around the area. The day we had the walkthrough, we had the suburban that was flying around. The other day, Sunday, we had a, a Friday, we had a meeting Friday night. Sure enough, a guy was peeling out. I mean, where can we be deputized or do something? We can take the license plate number of the vehicles that are doing report it to the city. But what can we do to be able to make it better? and make it safer. That's the whole thing. We know it's, you can't be there all the time, everywhere in the city, but we can, as citizens, do something to be able to make it safer. Whether we take license plate numbers, report it to the city, or what can we do as you know, obedient citizens, which is basically what we're trying to do. How can we reach out to officers, you know, council members, you guys, how we can we make it actually safer in that, in that aspect? If there's no, I mean, the recourse of actually hunting somebody down, it's like chain them down to hold them till they show up. That, I don't think that's the way to do it. There has to be other types of avenues that we need to be accessible for us to do it. You know, the way we can make it safer for the, I mean, there's a lot more kids in the area. And if the school is just growing, it'll be even bigger you know, I mean, we don't see this happening over Mr. by... Mr. Moore, maybe we could talk offline okay. and, and meet with our public works director well, and our acting transportation coordinator and figure out how we can use some of our training and, and, and the groups that we're working with to figure out how can we continue to work with okay. you. I know we, we have the crossing guard on the weekends and we have our police going. We need to do more, and I definitely understand that. And I know you all want to... to to yeah. roll up your sleeves and help out. Well, we're actually doing that every Sunday. Su Sunday, correct. Yeah, so, well, there's Sundays. And we appreciate yes. the officers showing up. They come by and they ask, how's it going? We, it's, you know, it's great. They're there. But I mean, it's like the whole thing. They can't be there all the time. We yeah. understand that. Mm -hmm. But what can we do as a community to be able to make it better? That's what we're asking to do. And that's one thing that Father Effin's been asking to do. Correct. Well, we'll coordinate a meeting um, okay. with uh, our public works director, uh, Fred, and f figure out what can we do to, ha to, to, okay. to, to, to move the needle forward. Again, thank you very much for, of your, course. for your help, and uh, let's make it safer. That's all we can do. Th thank thank you, you, sir. You guys have a good evening. Madeline Spencer. I just want to mention that there are still those placemaking strategies that do these amazing murals and streets to help traffic slowing. I don't know how we can do that, but like there's a ton of things. Um, one of the things um, I just wanted to kind of summarize, and I didn't finish earlier, but um, I think that there's cities all over the United States that are using a lot of non-conventional st strategies to do things that are finding innovative solutions for cities. And I just want to say that tonight we've been talking about a couple of different ones which are, for instance, the jail reuse and also cooperative development in the city. And in looking at those two strategies, the first thing I want to say is regarding uh, Vanier coming in here, I really think that this city needs to do some kind of a problem posing workshop with community. And that means that you actually go in and don't be informational but you say to them look here's what we're dealing with with our jail these are the monetary issues we're having and we can bring in experts with those cloud computing experts we can bring in those people and we can actually crunch the numbers and figure out as a community how we can make up the difference and make money off of what we're doing instead of not having that money and we need to be able to do that the other thing is that when we actually bring cooperatives it has the potential to target a microeconomic market and turn jobs in non-basic sectors um, 
something that normally export-based gross models ignore into employment that builds individual and collective wealth within communities. And there are millions of places showing that this is done. The Madrigan Corporation is one of the biggest cooperative development, federated cooperatives in the world. And the thing is that our city needs to start looking at in its general plan, its sustainability component, it needs all these policies to be written into that because we're not building this community for yesterday. We're building it for generations that are not even born. And so I just want to just make clear that we really need to make different moves and we need to have different vision and it needs to happen today with all of you and you're the only ones who can do that. Thank you, Madeline. Appreciate that. Uh, next, we have um, city manager comments followed by city council member comments. Madam city manager. Just two things I wanted to alert the council of. Uh, the body-worn camera program, there's been questions uh, um, about implementation. And the chief has let me know that the training is beginning this month and implementation will be in September. Um, and also, uh, this Saturday is the downtown Santa Ana Art Walk. Uh, vendors and live music in the Arts Village Promenade, and everyone is invited. Thank you. Thank you. Let's start off with Councilman Sarmiento, make our way. I'll be brief since the lights just went on. See, somehow <laughs> you missed turning it on on some. Just kidding. We'll all abide. But we, we'll, we'll all have mental clocks inside as we speak from now on. But I just simply wanted to um, say, you know, we did have a good discussion on the um, repurposing and on the study and the follow-up on the uh, U.S. Marshals um, uh, opportunity to, to go ahead and uh, work with them to stop some of the bleeding that we have there at the at the jail and um, I know that it's been a it's a difficult um, uh, problem that we have and I think Mayor Pro Tem's comments are well taken um, you know it was something that was entered into a long time ago, but now we find ourselves with a um, um, you know, large deficit problem as a result of some uh, contracts that were severed, and there'd be nothing better than I'd find uh, or that I could uh, hope for than a long-term binding contract with a tenant, but that not being available to us, then we have to work with what we have. I think that the repurpose study is important for us to continue pursuing um, and we do that concurrently with having this um, sort of stopgap um, solution to have the U.S. Marshals come in. That was never something that was, um, you know, off topic. I remember mentioning that, and I've had meetings with the U.S. Marshals when I knew that um, uh, the contract with, with ICE was being compromised, not because of any social or political reasons, but because I know they had some problems with the condition of some of the inmates and the medical treatment that they were receiving. So um, that's been a work in progress and it just happened to be coincidental that the proposal came before us because of their facility that's being built and it'll give us time to be more thoughtful in some of the opportunities that we have to repurpose the jail. Even if we were to select anything, um, you know, it's going to take time for us to you know, implement it and rehab the facility. So during that time, I think we can be more intelligent, more thoughtful about seeing what are realistic, feasible options for that for that facility. You know, we see things like um, a lot of changes in our you know in, in our environment um, opportunities that are going to be um, uh, you know bypassing some of our residents. You know, work is being automated. You know, there's artificial intelligence, data analy analytics, and just a lot of, of changing technology. And maybe that facility can be that space where we can talk about that um, changing economy and how we get our residents to leapfrog maybe some of the boundaries and some of the obstacles that they have um, to, you know, prepare themselves for that work, um, you know, for the next um, for the next few years. So, you know, looking at smart cities, um, looking at um, you know, development, wealth creation for our residents is very important. So that's where I see that space becoming. But in the meantime, we need to make sure that um, we have enough resources to provide services for our residents now. So with that, I'll say good night. Thank you, Councilman Sarmiento. Jose Solorio. Thank you. Council member. Uh, a few of us attended the Wilshire Square Neighborhood Association 21st summer concert. It was amazing. We had a good time. Uh, the music was good and people stayed up and danced the night away and it was uh, it was a job well done. I know 
some of the audience were there too and uh, uh, congratulations to all the organizers um, one thing I forgot to say on the work cooperative item because of the red light <laughs> was a, something related but just as important that we need to look at is um, the costs of a business license in Santa Ana are too high mm -hmm. the application is too complicated it needs to be simplified I think uh, maybe if we could figure out where the revenue is the same but we create more categories or options I think uh, that might be helpful um, I know I have a business license of my, myself in, in town and so I know what the fees are and we all get complaints from folks on how it, it's substantially less than other cities and so whether you're a cooperative or a small business or a home-based business or a micro enterprise that's a concern as well because you also got to pay that annually so we ought to look at that and I don't know if it's part of the revenue study we're looking at that but when we look at the issue of cooperatives and things like that maybe that's an opportunity to look at the the, the categories and, and, and types and amounts also uh, I received word from my historic resources commissioner uh, and others uh, that with the mm, potential lapsing of the historic re historic registry program that we had that discounted some of those fees that uh, there's a backlog because the person that was in charge has left and so there's this queue there's people that have been trying to apply but it's been hard getting answers that there's an interest in seeing if it can't be uh, the current program can't be continued another three to six months uh, I don't know if that could be done administratively or if that needs to come back to the council, but I'd like staff to please explore that. Uh, finally, I do want to thank uh, my colleague, uh, Council Member Villegas, for bringing forward the issue of domestic violence uh, because it's an issue that a lot of folks don't like to talk about, but I know uh, there's a lot of trauma, there, there's a lot of harm, a lot of hurt in our community because of domestic violence and it affects uh, more families than we think. Uh, and so bringing attention to it and hopefully one day um, making uh, come alive a domestic violence family justice center uh, as the council member proposing is uh, a solid idea so I commend him on that thank you thank you council Mr. Lawyer councilman Villegas thank you my pro Tim Martinez <clears throat> I'd like to echo uh, the uh, council member Salodia was saying about a the, uh, the turnout over at the Wilshire Square was uh, it was a great event, great turnout. Also, I agree with the business licenses being a little too high. I remember I was paying seventy five dollars for a business license in Irvine. I came here the following year and it was two hundred dollars. So, definitely uh, needs to be looked at. <clears throat> also, uh, real quick, uh, not too long ago there was a fentanyl overdose or fentanyl uh, tragedy that took place off of Fairview and I want to commend OCFA Chief Black get that down to the troops over there what a great job that they they did uh, this is something that, I don't know if you hear about it in the news but fentanyl is uh, very toxic it's really strong narcotics very cheap it's taking they're mixing it with um, uh, heroin so we had one deceased in that event that took place. They had to do the hazmat out there. They had to do the whole, the whole works, evacuate people um, from the building because that that stuff can get in the air and it'll hurt you, possibly kill you. That is what our law enforcement community and the firefighters are dealing with now. So uh, I commend you for the good work. Please be safe. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Councilman Villegas. Before I adjourn this meeting, I'll just make some uh, just brief comments. Um, I also wanted, um, you know, and we talked about Wilshire Square, but I also thank Kennegar Park for their uh, um, uh, amazing fair that they had, and I think it was their first, and uh, good job, well done out there. I, I, I had the opportunity to go out there and, and saw the bike rodeo with Saz and, and, and Put it on Facebook. It's really cool to see the various uh, folks out there, even folks from different neighborhoods, come and support Hinninger Park. And so I just thought that that was fantastic. And of course, Wilshire Square always has a great um, 
a concert and so it's always fun to to attend and especially now that I live in, in that neighborhood and uh, it's great to get to know a lot of the of my neighbors and, and go out there and, 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 and sit with them so it's been fun um, the other you know we've been talking about the worker cooperatives but um, you know we put a, an economic strategic plan that's still in draft mode and I know that um, we had the Chamber of Commerce, other working groups that were discussing business license and business fees. Well, what did we do with all that information? Uh, did we have any steps that were going to come to this council? Was it put in this economic uh, strategic plan draft? Because this is essentially when we talk about economic development, this is what we're talking about: worker cooperatives, you know, small business. Uh, we talked about you know issues as pertains to, to to business license fees. I just never saw that. I just met with folks from the Chamber of Commerce uh, just yesterday and. And um, you know, talk to them about branding our, um, our economic strategic plan and how what can we do to move all these things forward. And so it seems that we're we're up here asking. And so maybe we can bring back this economic strategic plan that is I don't, I'm not sure if it's in draft form. It's it's, for, it's formalized. I'm a little confused. Um, it was never brought back to committee, but it was brought here. Um, so I, I'm I'm a little lost. I'll give you a quick update, uh, and then we certainly will come back. Uh, we're relooking at the strategy. We think it needs updated. We think that uh, uh, Santa Ana has um, taken on some new initiatives in working with uh, where we see our economy going, and that the plan doesn't reflect those very well. So it's not ready to come back okay. yet. We think we need to, to add some things. I, I do have to admit that I have not... Uh, delved in or actually heard about the discussion on business license fees. Uh, let me get more informed about that and talk to the chamber uh, about what work they were doing and then maybe we can tie the two together. Fantastic. Great. Thank you. Um, the other th uh, thing that I, I, I know we have an upcoming event and maybe Madeline you could give me the date. I know for the uh, first time the city you know with the sponsorships and we did a lot of sponsorships today but uh, we approved uh, sponsorship for for a, a young student uh, who um, um, is back from college from Tufts University that is going to be doing some coding, uh, teaching our residents how to code. And I've been talking about data analytics, the new digital revolution, and this young man is going to uh, be at Garfield Elementary uh, um, Center. And I think the first one is August 19th, and then the second opportunity... August 26th, and so I want to encourage our residents, um, and there's a link out there, and maybe I'll send it to our, our staff so that we can forward it to our neighborhood associations and put it out there, but, um, you know, as we talk about employment, um, essentially we're moving in that direction, um, and we want to make sure we prepare our, our not only our young st um, students, but those that, um, who are in the, uh, in, in the world of, of the working environment that in many respects only have a job because they're trying to make ends meet. Um, and there are many of my friends that I know that went and got educated and, and you know, are underemployed and are looking to, to, to navigate into different fields. And so this is definitely a good one. And so um, I think coding um, has been uh, around for a very long time, um, but um, more, and more so companies are moving in that direction and certainly need folks with that, um, uh, with, with those kinds of uh, tra training and, and, and skills to, to help them move um, upward with, with upward mobility. The next thing that I would just um, also um, state um, from regional board I, I sit on SCAG, and um, I know times that um, we want to get out of here, but um, it's the appropriate time for us to give updates on the regional boards that we sit on and also the council committees. And uh, it's rare that I hear my colleagues who chair the council committees or sit on regional boards give updates to, to the public. I do my best to provide my update on my newsletter to send that out. And so I just wanted to state very quickly on SCAG, and, 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 and um, we're doing a pilot, and I know our staff finally has given the information about the 30,000-plus businesses that we have in the city. Uh, SCAG is doing a pilot in, in partnership with uh, Wallace Walrod to look at our business licenses and 
really get information and data so that um, um, it's not for Santa Ana, <laughs> but it is for the SCAG region as we try to move forward with data analytics. And I'm the chair of the Open Data Big Data Committee, but uh, they're focused on Santa Ana and these 30,000 businesses and getting as much information as we possibly can. What kind of small businesses do we have? What, what, what are the sectors? What are the sectors that are growing? How much revenue? We talk about retail and we know that retail is changing. Um, and so how we look at land use and, and zoning and parking. And so we're going to have a lot of vacant spaces as, as many malls are starting to close down and, and other major stores. And so we have to start looking at our small businesses and how can we continue to cultivate them and help them and help them grow. Um, and so um, this information is going to be very, um, I believe, very valuable, not just for Santa Ana, but for the Southern California region and how we could actually look at possible policy decisions as it pertains to land use um, and zoning and, and some of the growth sectors within small business. And so I'm excited about that. It should be coming. Um, they're, they're, they're underway um, getting the, the data, and hopefully um, it will be coming to the SCAG uh, uh, General Council in a couple months, and then hopefully a uh, presentation here uh, to Santa Ana uh, to share the results of the 30,000-plus businesses that we have here. Um, I really want to move our city into data analytics and figuring out how can we use the information that we have here. It's power. We have a lot of information, and, and you know we talk about about public acts requests and, and, the, and, and the amount of time that not only our clerk's office, our city manager's office is taking is that we got to get that information out there publicly so that we can utilize our staff to, 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 to do other things. And so um, it's one step at a time. I definitely understand that. And so I just wanted to share that. Um, and as well, um, lastly, on the Orange County um, Council of Governments, um, you, you know, I, I'm not sure where we go and it's tied to the um, to, to SCAG, but this is the body that uh, essentially um, helps with uh, the RTP and the SES here at the regional level um, and the planning that we're, we're, we're doing. Um, I sit there. We have an alternate. There are times where I can't because there's conflict. I have conflicting meetings because I sit on too many boards, and so I'm just going to ask my colleagues that I'm coming back. Now that I'm drawing down on my 16 months, I'm going to have to remove myself from other um, uh, boards, and so I'm hopeful that you all can step up um, because it's coming to that time, and, and, and I'm just spread out. Um, and, and, and with my 16 months left, I, I, I have to phase out. And so I just wanted to just state that to you all. Um, so um, just for you all to keep that in mind in the next couple months, I will be um, bringing to the clerk uh, what I can sit on and what I can't sit on anymore. And it would be, it's important for us to sit on these um, boards, um, not only from a perspective that, you know, we're at the table, we're making um, – there are folks that are making regional decisions on behalf of, the, of our city, and we have to be at the table or we're going to be on the menu. And so it's, it's imperative uh, for us to, to, to consider that. And then um, lastly, just want to adjourn. Uh, adjourn this meeting. Uh, the next scheduled meeting is for August 15, 2017 at 5 p.m. Um, and I want to also adjourn this meeting in memory of Hortensia Arquisa and Jerry Clay um, Aries. Uh, so if we could take a moment of silence and, and, and adjourn this meeting. Thank you. Have a good evening.